All right, I think we are sort of uh, set to start here. So let me go ahead and get started. Uh, my name is Kareem Yagmor, and um, this is the Android Micro Conference for Linux Plumbers 2021. So welcome everyone. Um, good morning, good evening, good afternoon, whatever it is for you. Uh, we all have our different time zones. So um, much like every year, um, this is a good opportunity for the Android community to sort of sync up with um, the uh, rest of the Linux community. This year has a different sort of uh, focus or I should say theme. Um, previous years have been for sort of more of a, you know, an expose of what Google has been up to and sort of an opportunity for the community to ask questions. This year is slightly different wherein uh, we actually um, are trying to solicit sort of uh, 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 more a, um, a joined uh, effort uh, of reflection on uh, where things should move forward. So we invited uh, key uh, members of the community to come in and um, sort of uh, discuss different topics as you'll see uh, as part of the schedule, all right? Um, the other thing that's a bit different here is the um, the slots are 20 minutes instead of 15. I mean, not a huge difference, but still, um, the, the the we've had in past years sort of run up to the uh, limit there of the 15 minute mark. So, uh, being able to uh, to have uh, these additional five minutes is going to be welcome. So, uh, let me quickly run through uh, some of the. Uh, preparation slides here that we got, uh, as well as um, also a sort of uh, uh, just to give you uh, a few uh, caveats and, and instructions as we go. So um, this year um, we've got a number of different sponsors and uh, we'd like to thank them for their support. Um, they're absolutely needed for this event. So Facebook, which is a diamond sponsor, um, IBM, which is uh, the platinum sponsor. Um, and if we can get that on the screen here, Sorry about that. All right, there we go. Sort of coordinating two screens. Um, gold sponsors are and Microsoft. Um, then we've got silver sponsors um, and um, speaker gift uh, sponsor and uh, t-shirt sponsor. And uh, of course the uh, conference services which are offered by Linux Foundation, which has been uh, supporting uh, Linux plumbers for quite a few years. All right, uh, we'd like to thank the, um, the chairs um, and the committee uh, for uh, all their work. I mean, uh, they've been doing a fantastic job for bringing this uh, together uh, through the years. Um, and, uh, uh, you know, some of these folks have been long serving here for um, on, on Linux plumbers. Um, all right, so of course, you know, um, the conference is supposed to be done with uh, respectful um, sort of environment. So uh, if there's any abuses or anything like that, uh, please uh, bring them back to the community, uh, to the committee and we'll take care of them uh, in due time. Uh, one thing that we wanted to sort of just give you a heads up, there's been a slight swap of uh, presentations between uh, Rust and uh, <clears throat> speculative page faults. So if you had sort of scheduled yourself for attending those, uh, keep that in mind uh, as, as we go forward here. Okay, so um, for those of you who have not attended the previous one, there's effectively moderators, which is myself and a couple other folks, uh, presenters who will be presenting and then attendees. Uh, we'd like you to keep your mics off and cameras off unless you need to speak. Um, I told you about the 20 minute slots, they will be hard enforced. Um, so please try to keep the conversation going. Um, and we will sort of call you on that if you sort of uh, go above the sort of 10 minute mark. Uh, in a rather firm fashion. We will swap slides at about the 17, 18 minute mark. I'm about to finish talking myself to hand it off to um, to Todd, uh, who will be doing the first presentation. There will be BOF on Friday, um, which is now part of the official schedule. So we were still sort of waiting on this in the last minute. So that's been taken care of. Um, and uh, as you sort of finish your um, presentation, we'd like you to take notes because that's going to be required for moving forward, right? And that's pretty much it from my side. Uh, Todd, uh, the ball is all yours. Okay. Um, I think, John, you're switching the slides.
Yeah, I no longer have presenter here, so somebody else is, uh, is, is uh, you are, I think, um, and the slides, there we go. There we go. Okay, so uh, as Kareem said, we're, we've changed the format to be more discussion oriented, more in line with the rest of plumbers. However, this first talk is more along the old lines and more of a status update because we did want to start off giving uh, an update on what is the kind of the, the big changes that have been going on. It's a multi-year project um, from the Android kernel team at Google. Um, and that's the GKI, the generic kernel image. So my name is Todd Chos. I'm the, the kernel lead for that project. Um, and so uh, we've been talking I was, so, I was somehow getting muted. Hopefully you heard what I said so far. Um, uh, so we're gonna give a, a quick status update um, and, and then we probably won't have much time for discussion. So if you do have questions, we can take them in the chat or we have a birds of a feather session on Friday at the same time where we can go in depth on any questions you have on any of the topics today. Um, so uh, with that, we'll start. Um, so this is the architecture slide. We've showed this now for a couple of years that sort of describes what, what GKI is. Um, we have the, the, what we call the generic kernel, which is really the core kernel minus, minus modules. Um, and and the big focus has been to get all of the SOC hardware specific code out of the core kernel and into separate modules so that we can get it as clean and generic as possible. Um, and, you know, from past years discussions, you probably already know that what actually ships on an Android device in the past has been a device kernel with changes that come from the Android team and, and from a reference kernel that we maintained and then changes from an SOC vendor and then changes from an OEM. And so the kernel that actually ships on a device is very custom for that device and, and uh, uh, very different from the upstream version of Linux. And so we've been We've been working to change that for a number of reasons, which I'm not going to get into here, but was the topic of last year's talk. So you can go look at that. We also have public documentation on GKI that you can read. Um, so the, the, the big push, and this is a multi-year push, has been to get all of the hardware specific code out of the generic kernel into vendor modules. And, and then the you know, one of the big parts of this effort is that we have to have a stable interface between those vendor modules and the generic kernel so that they can ship asynchronously. We've also had plumbers talks on how we're maintaining that, that stable KMI. So we're not gonna go into that today either, but again, you're free to ask questions or, or look at our public documentation on that. Um, so status wise, when, when uh, we talked last year at plumbers, we were, we were close to shipping what we called GKI 1.0, which was sort of, which was the, the first iteration of what is gonna be several iterations um, where we worked with our partners. There was lots more upstreaming activity in the Android community, a lot more patches that would have been on devices that were actually submitted upstream. And if not submitted upstream, submitted to the Android kernel. Um, and the separation, we made a lot of progress on that separation between the hardware specific code and the common code. And last year in Android 11, we, we sh shipped this GKI 1.0, which was a compliance test really, where the, the, pro the kernel that shipped on devices had to implement the KMI interface uh, and then pass tests with the GKI kernel in place for certification. But then the actual devices that shipped, the, or the actual uh, kernels that shipped on devices was the device kernel modified by the SOC vendor and the uh, OEMs um, as before. Um, that 
that was a success. And you can see today, if you have devices with the 5.4 kernel, that is all this GKI 1.0. And it's not running the GKI kernel, but you can, on your device, uh, reflash it with the GKI kernel plus Google's version of the system partition, and that will work. And, and uh, it's been spot tested in a few cases and does seem to work. Um, this year, with Android 12, which will be shipping you know, within a few months, uh, we're taking that a step further and actually shipping the generic kernel on devices. So again, we've been working very closely with all of those partners to get everything in place so that, that their products have the features that they need to be competitive in the marketplace, but that we could make the separation and have a generic kernel uh, separated from the implementation of the hardware features or even or some of their value add features. Um, the the testing has changed. They don't have to do any special testing for GKI, except that there are tests when they're running for compliance that verify that the kernel that's part of the test is our certified image that was built by Google. <coughs> Um, so the, the, the big difference between the kernels that we're shipping with GKI and upstream is, is that we rely heavily on out of tree modules for the vendor, the implementations of the vendor code. Uh, so it, it is, uh, so, so there's a set of patches that wouldn't really fly upstream that we accept in order to make that happen. And, and so sort of running down the classes of those issues, we provide a notion of vendor hooks. So where in the past a, a vendor or an OEM may have made a change in the core kernel, um, if that's a, a feature that is really important for their product this year, we provide what we call a vendor hook that allows them to uh, get control at some key points in the core kernel to implement their value adds. Um, and the way that's implemented is we, we have two flavors of hooks. One is our regular hooks, which is really nothing more than trace points. And so they uh, instantiate a, tra a trace point. We have a naming convention that we can easily identify that it's one of these uh, vendor hooks. Um, and then they can attach to the trace point from their vendor module and implement whatever, uh, whatever they need to implement at that location. We have a second flavor, which we call restricted hooks. Um, those are, those differ from trace points in the sense that they, they, uh, uh, the, the code that executes behind the handler is not necessarily in an atomic context. It's in, a, it's in whatever context the hook was in. So it's, it's not just a naked pointer, but you could think of it as that, where whatever context the, uh, the hook is executing in, it transfers control to the vendor module um, in that same context. And so that allows, in some cases, sleeps and, and some other things. And then also in order to support this, we have a number of exports that we enable that wouldn't normally be allowed upstream, but we need to to allow uh, vendors to implement some of this, this functionality in their vendor modules. And then we have special kconfig options as well for cases where a module is, a module if it were turned on in the build would also select a number of other configs. We need to select those on behalf of those modules when building the core kernel. Uh, this, this slide just shows what those hooks look like. So in the core kernel, it just looks like a trace point in the vendor module that you can register for it. Uh, and then they have a handler that executes. Um, we, uh, we prefer this over over the code actually being added as out of tree code into the Android kernel, because first of all, it lets different vendors and OEMs implement the handlers in different ways. And secondly, of course, what we prefer is no extra code. We wanna be as close to upstream as we possibly can. Um, and so we're, we're, we're allowing a lot of these hooks right now. We hope eventually to 
to start working through those and get all that uh, all that value added code upstream as well. But this is a multi year project. We don't expect that we'll ever get all the way there. Um, and sort of and going forward, you know, right now we're in this this first period here, 2020 to 2022, and and what we're really working on hard is getting the whole Android kernel development community to implement what they need to for their products in either via uh, hooks or in some cases patches that go into Android mainline. And so we look at that as we're taking, you know, all of the ways that the whole the whole ecosystem differed from upstream Linux and pushing that up into the Android kernel for now in the form of hooks or in the form of out of tree patches that go into the Android kernel. Uh, uh, there's been a lot of, as I mentioned before, a lot of upstreaming activity. So a lot of that stuff that's always been buried in device kernels has already been upstreamed. We're isolating it to vendor modules. Again, that might mean hooks in the core kernel. Um, or we're taking some patches into the Android common kernel. We, we're trying to minimize that. Uh, and then, and then as we move on that, uh, all of that technical debt that we're accumulating in the Android common kernel, we're analyzing uh, and, and working towards uh, eliminating that debt. But right now we're accumulating it faster than we're eliminating it. And you can see the debt uh, pretty clearly. We keep a quilt series for, for our Android mainline, which is our branch that tracks the mainline kernel uh, in a quilt series at that link. Um, and, and so 20, yep. 2023, 2024, we believe that the, we'll, we'll start reducing debt faster than we are accumulating it. And the goal of course, is to get as aligned with, with upstream as we possibly can. Um, though since since out of tree modules are really important for our use case, we do expect that we'll always have a set of exports um, and and some things that are um, you know that are different or in, in addition to to what's upstream. But but this whole project is a multi year project working towards getting rid of as many out of tree patches as we possibly can and aligning as much as possible with upstream. Uh, so with that, we have probably a minute or two if there's a quick question. Uh, otherwise, we'll defer all questions to the the BOF on Friday. Uh, Todd, there's one from Geert, which is, uh, do you support any interrupt controllers or timers than GSI, other than GSI and off timers and modules? Uh, I can answer. Not, yeah, we'll let Sarah no. answer that one. We do support uh, timers and interrupt uh, as modules. Actually, interrupt controllers as modules as uh, upstream too. We support it in upstream now. The timer stuff, we're working through it uh, to upstream that part. All right, maybe one more quick question. Uh, yes, that is one. Um... Uh, from Brian Masney, which is uh, to help make the kernel more generic, are there plans from the Android project to request ACPI firmware from the hardware vendors? Uh, there aren't plans right now simply because in the ARM64 ecosystem, where which we, we aren't doing x86 right now, the, all the devices that are part of the GKI are, are ARM64. And so in our ecosystem, there hasn't been there haven't been requests for uh, ACPI. If there were, we would certainly work with it to to get there. If we ever did an an x86 version, I think we would also uh, we would be looking at that. So, currently, answer is no. And with that, I think we better move on to the next talk. Alrighty, we you should have control. Okay, so I, I will actually start and then uh, uh, hand over to, to Wei. Um, so hi everyone, I'm Quentin and uh, Wei and I 
uh, are going to talk about uh, some of the, the work we've been doing on UCLAM for Android. So if you can go to the next slide, wait, you would. Um, I guess to start, uh, what, what we should say is that Android has now switched to using uh, UClamp completely and only UClamp. We have abandoned uh, Skatune, which uh, some of you may know as the, as the out of tree uh, Android specific equivalent of UClamp that we used to carry uh, in Android, but that's, that's completely gone now. We, we've switched to UClamp and we're committed to using UClamp. And as we've switched from Skatune to UClamp, we have tried to really uh, make good use of all of the new features that UClamp is bringing to the table. And by that, I mean that we have also been using things such as the max clamping feature and uh, the per task API. And as we've tested those things, we have found a few cases where uh, uh, those features were not exactly behaving the way we were expecting them to work. And we found a few issues and, and pain points. So what we would like to do is basically discuss some of those pain points with the, with the community and hopefully find, uh, you know, discuss possible solutions to, to move forward. Um, so can you go to the next slide? Please? Yeah. So just to, to introduce the first problem, uh, I'd like to walk you through the, the, the setup we have for the CPU controller today. Uh, it's, the, the setup is pretty simple. We, we have one group per role of applications. Uh, and so what that means is that basically the, the application that is currently in focus on the, the, the phone of the user will be classified as the top app application. And all of the tasks of that application go into the top app group. All of the apps that are uh, running on the device but that are not currently in focus or interacting with the user go into the background group. The foreground group is dedicated for things that are visible to the user, but the user can't interact with, interact with it. The system group is for system threads and so on and so forth. So we have a bunch of groups like this uh, where we classify the tasks. And, and when a user switches from one application to the other, uh, then we migrate the, the threads between the groups in order to reflect that change. Uh, in terms of UClamp settings, uh, we are using UClamp min for the top app group in order to boost uh, those, those tasks that are important as per the definition of importance that, that we have in Android. Uh, and we use uh, a UClamp max on the background group in order to not waste power on those, on those tasks. So yeah, that, that's pretty much the, the, the setup that we have. Uh, now, if you are familiar with C groups, you will probably think that this setup is actually not, uh, well, let's say not perfect because it goes completely against the, the official recommendation for C groups, which is to classify once and then to tune the parameters. Uh, so if we wanted to do that in Android, we would basically need to create one group per application and then we would tune the parameters of those groups dynamically instead of migrating between groups with static, uh, static parameters. Uh, and we have tried to do that. And in fact, we have been able to to move to the correct model uh, for other uh, CPU controllers, I believe. But in the specific case of the CPU controller, we have uh, seen a few issues uh, with that. And so specifically what we have seen is that in order to use UClamp min efficiently, uh, uh, sorry, UClamp max efficiently on the background group, we also needed to, to use uh, CPU as well. And that has uh, uh, made the, the, our setup for, for the CPU controller a lot more complicated. So with that, I will let uh, Wade take over to explain in more details uh, what exactly we've been doing with CPU shells and why uh, that, that is a problem uh, for the CPU controller. Okay, thanks uh, Quintan for the, for the introduction. Uh, so uh, let me share some of the learnings and the experience we are uh, basically, we have been uh, experiencing, uh, experiencing like in the uh, in the migrating to the uh, new new climb feature from the absolute kernel. So as Quentin just mentioned, right, uh, the first problem I'm going to talk about is the CPU shares versus the uh, unified hierarchy of the C group. Uh, okay, so. Let me first talk about like the CPU shares usage in Android. So per our 
experiment and study, uh, CPU shares actually can help, for example, like some, sometimes 5% to even half of the latency reduction uh, for app launch use case under, for example, some heavy background workload, for example, Dex to Wavy. Uh, this is a compiler program that uh, updating your app or doing the background ODA. Uh, the CPU shares actually the feature help guarantee the top app and other, you know, like non background like work can get a decent amount of like CPU time. So in regardless of like those background execution, so that's uh, the main usage of like the CPU shares. However, uh, like the CPU shares, uh, we only want to pull those to background group, uh, like two reasons mainly, right? So the first is uh, like, I think like, let me switch the uh, very first, uh, this is the CPU V1 hierarchy that we're currently using in Android, right? Mm -hmm. So the problem of like setting your client, uh, setting the CPU shares on this uh, hierarchy is that we only want to share, uh, I mean, set the CPU shares on the background group. Uh, however, there's a multiple other group parallel to CPU shares, right? The system is mainly the root group. We don't have anything in the root. So the foreground group is, as Quinto mentioned, some foreground or user-facing services, important system server services, and top app apparently is the one that's currently rendering the screen. So we want to share, uh, set the CPU shares on the background, but uh, like that will also introduce, because those are parallel group, introduce a fairness between those groups. Uh, if like, they are migrating to C group V2, the problem become uh, more inviolable because like, as I just mentioned, uh, what about like those uh, parallel group, the fairness between them. And uh, also uh, some, another reason mentioned here is uh, the number of like the, the group, uh, the, the app is also non-static. So it's hard to scale a uh, fixed uh, bandwidth as a pre-setting. Uh, so if we do like the V2 migration, we have to adjust, like the, adjust the shares dynamically, uh, which is possible, but roughly like complicated, uh, complicated for the user space. The second, uh, the, the last one is also related to the C group hierarchy. So uh, CPU shares and uh, UCLAM currently share the same controller. Uh, I will switch back to the, uh, to the graph. So as Quinton just mentioned, right, right, we have several settings among those different groups for min and max setting. But also we want to only set uh, the CPU shares on background group. So this is actually limiting the, the, the usage of uh, the UCLAM and CPU shares together. Okay, so the next problem is uh, slightly related to the first one. So it's about uh, the, uh, the UCLAN max aggregation. So currently like the UCLAN max aggregation uh, follows uh, the rule uh, listed here. So the ranking level of the utilization is sum of the order tasks and uh, UCLAN max is actually the max of those, right? Uh, the problem we see is that, so for example, uh, long running background work uh, that with some UCLAN setting, for example, here, this is a 50. And uh, there could be a very short of uh, non-restricted top app work co-scheduled on the same CPU. So if that happens, then the run queue level of like the UCLAN max is released and uh, then the CPU is just to go to the max. Uh, even though the utilization of the top app task is quite small, it's basically a very small task. So we don't need like that boost. Uh, but due to this uh, implementation, uh, we have to go to at max. 
for no reason. Uh, another problem uh, is that uh, right now we have like a single Euclidean max value that maps to that, for example, the 50 value here can actually map to a very inefficient uh, CPU on some, 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 some cluster, for example, little cluster. Uh, maybe ending model based frequency selection could really help for this kind of issue. Uh, on the proposal side, uh, or as a product workaround, uh, is that we're considering using the UCLAN max at the CFS runtime level. So the contribution of the, the entire CFS subtree is, will be restricted by the UCLAN setting. So we have like the CPU, uh, the UCLAN max setting per uh, group, right? And the per group UCLAN max will be uh, the entire subtree's run queue or CFS run queue's uh, contribution to the, to the CPU level of run queue. Uh, the next uh, one is uh, also related to the uh, to the last problem is that uh, we also want to let the CPU run at the efficient point for each power domain given the UCLAN max setting. So those are the whenever you get the chance, if you can sort of switch to the discussion, it'd be great because we have about eight minutes left, um, and we want to try to uh, have as much discussion as possible. If whenever you get the chance, if you can switch to that, it'd be great. Okay. Uh, okay. We, anyway, we can we can stick with the previous uh, with the previous slide with the proposal and see if if anybody has some thoughts about that about the idea of clamping at the sub uh, at the CFS rank queue level instead of clamping only at the rank queue level at the, the root CFS rank queue level. Uh, I'm just curious to, to see if anybody in the in the audience has like a, you know an objections against that or, or ideas uh, to implement that differently or you know, issues. Yeah so uh, I think um, what you what you use here is that uh, your specific setup of task groups, right? That you have those foreground, background, top up thing as first level C groups, and then you per C you you decide should I use the clamp value of this container as a task group, or should I use the real util average of of the CFS run queue attached to this task group, and you sum those four groups up which least lets you also consider the, the tasks which are running the, in, the, in the root CFS run queue. And those guys, you probably don't clamp. And then you sum up all of this, and this is then the value you use for uh, determine, determining the, the, CF, uh, the, the, the overall system utilization. And this is what you, so you clamp only per, per first level uh, task group. Yeah, I guess the idea is really to to, um, to prevent uh, an important task from contributing uh, to more than 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 the uh, max uh, and, and, level stuff. And those un, unimportant tasks, uh, they are essentially in the root CFS run queue, right? Not necessarily. I mean, they can. Okay. If they, if, if we have tasks in a group. Uh, or even, you know, it doesn't have to be at the, the CFS rank level, actually. But, but if we have tasks that have a UCLAN max set through some way, uh, we want to make sure that they cannot contribute to the rank queue level request to something higher than what they have been limited. Uh, the, the, the problem that that way has described in the previous slide is basically that we have a task background task that is running for a very, very long time because it is clamped. The utilization of that task goes up really high. Uh, and then when we have a, an, like a top-up task that doesn't have a max that is cost okay. in that country, all of a sudden the utilization of that unimportant background task becomes visible. True. No, no, I, I think the, the yeah. problem is understood. Yeah. And so I think that what the suggestion with the, the CFS rank queue stuff is to, is to make sure that uh, that background, an important background task, 
can never no. explode the, 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 the run queue level request by clumping at earlier in the in the stack some, some, somehow. But I think this problem can also be solved differently, right? By when we are mainline now in max aggregation, we just don't consider those other, we find a way to not consider those other tasks to ruin the max aggregation, which is essentially happening right now. So we don't have to do this kind of iterating over all the CFS run queues if there would be a way to do this. Uh, Just like the, the, the example you gave, like the, the, small the small task which comes in, which is not UCLAN max, mm -hmm. find a way to, 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 to avoid that this task ruins the clamping scenario you just have for the long running background task. You mean by, by not placing it on... By not considering it for clamping. By not considering it for clamping. Uh, I'm not saying there is a solution already, but like we don't, I mean, your solution you have is, is perfect, working perfectly fine for you. But like I said, it's very, it's very much uh, uh, limited or, or, or supported by your CFS run queue or by your task group setup in Android. It's limited, right? You have control over it. And, um, and you also probably don't use the per task interface. You just rely on UCLAMP max interface per, per uh, CFS per, per, per task group. Right. right, all the tasks you put into a task group, they essentially have to obey to the UCLAMP max value of the task group. You don't use this second level thing where the task can have its, its own task group, yeah. uh, its own UCLAMP max value. Yeah, it's got three minutes left. Uh, Martin, was, was there something you wanted to talk about? Um, yeah, uh, we've actually been discussing this problem a little bit in, uh, in our team. And mm -hmm. the problem you describe where you have something that turns up and sort of lifts the cap and you're not interested in doing so. I can see that problem, but you can't really ignore all tasks. You need to find a way to, to, uh, to exclude some tasks from, from your criteria for lifting the UPLAN max. And I think there are ways to do it. The, the problem here is if you're, if you're not careful, you might break the, uh, or you might reduce the performance of tasks that are not clamped. It's, well, it's a very yeah. deep discussion to discuss how UPLAN max breaks various things in, in the scheduler, because you suddenly have some utilization that's actually using a lot of CPU time, but at the same time, you sort of close your eyes and say, no, this is clamped, so it doesn't actually count more than this, but in reality, it counts this much. And, and that breaks a lot of things, but I think there is a clever way that you can uh, you can get around the problem. So I, I think we should try to have a, a deep dive on it, perhaps in a different setting. Okay, that, that sounds good. I think we should uh, take it offline. Uh, I think we're running out of time, but uh, yep. that, that sounds good. We should, we should take it offline. Sure. Okay, thank you guys very much. Thank you. Yeah, we, we still have two minutes if you want to continue, uh, but we're going to be switching, of course, to the um, next presentation. And I encourage you to sort of come back and discuss this at the BOF uh, later on uh, on Friday. If you want to continue this conversation, you're more than welcome to join uh, and, and, and further uh, discuss it there. So we're just going to wait. Uh, uh, yeah, your audio might be off here. Uh, we're just going to wait for just a proper mark there, and we'll start. And um, just make sure your audio is on. You're, I think, on. You're on. Just listen. Uh, you're um, the sort of uh, icon on the. Uh, there you go. You might have got your mic uh, properly working. You test it now. So Paul's, Paul's audio is good. Uh, Alessio, do you want to trust your audio? Okay, let's see. I hope it works. Okay. Yeah, I can hear you now. Okay, floor is yours. Okay, so hello everyone. My name is Alessio Balsini. I'm going to introduce you uh, to this presentation together with Paul Lawrence. So we will be presenting how we are using Fuse in Android, uh, the performance bottlenecks we identified, and we would also be talking about uh, a couple of mi uh, mitigations that we are currently working on. So in Android, we are using Fuse for a bunch of different reasons. So basically what it 
happens is that uh, an application, when it tries to accept some uh, shared data, it uses um, a fuse mount point that uh, with a fuse driver, it would be getting all the file system operations and the fuse driver would be forwarding all these operations to uh, a fuse daemon through the slash dev slash fuse file. The fuse daemon would basically implement uh, all the logic behind these uh, file system operations. It can be either single threaded or multi-threaded. And as long as in our case, the fuse daemon is basically implemented a, a stacked pass through file system, all these operations would be almost kind of happening to a lower file system that is implemented as uh, either F2FS, ext4 or others. And why we are using Fuse. So there's a bunch of reasons why uh, the Fuse architecture is very helpful for us. First of all, because updating a Fuse daemon is much, much easier than updating the kernel. And we would be also uh, able to have some extra permission checks. So for instance, we can be more fine grade in checking if uh, an application can access some folders or some specific files. We can also implement data reduction. So at runtime, we can change the contents of a return file. So for example, um, in our specific case, if a picture has some information in their uh, metadata, for instance, GPS location, but the application trying to access this file doesn't have this permission, we can zero this metadata. We can also implement things like live transcoding. So maybe the file that is a media file that uh, is encoded in the storage with a very optimized uh, and new encoding, we can return a different encoded, um, encoded file that can be read by applications that, that are legacy and are not implementing that, that specific code. Uh, we can also simplify uh, some behaviors like uh, in a smartphone, we might plug or unplug some SD cards or anything. And this can be much easier to handle with, uh, with a stack file system like this. The problem is that with this complex architecture, we have some uh, additional fuse daemon logic, but this is something that we want because this is part of our uh, our feature or the fuse daemon feature. Um, unfortunately, we also have um, a few extra VFS traversals. So we are accessing two different file systems and we like the fact that uh, we have some extra um, like permission checkings at every entry point, but in the case we are doing exactly um, a pass through the stacking file system and we are returning exactly for instance the same file we have in the in the backing file system then we would be caching the same pages twice for both the fuse file system and the uh, lower file system plus in this long uh, pipeline of, of events we we would be passing a bunch of data that is mostly pointers, plus we also, Fuse also implements splicing and read ahead that are helping uh, with these. But the problem is that with writes and random read or write operations, this, uh, this is still an issue and is, is a spot where that, that we can improve. Plus the long pipeline also introduces some communication delays and context switches for the Fuse daemon and the applications that uh, are executing concurrently. And we also have a bunch of user to kernel and vice versa switches. The Fuse daemon can be multi-programmed, but again, if we want to do that, we need to have some extra lockings that still prevent some, some, some scaling. And these whole issues are happening at almost every Fuse file system operation. So the first solution we, we were proposing is Fuse pass-through. And uh, I take the chance of thanking everybody in the community who uh, either contributed or gave really helpful feedback. And thank to, thanks to your help, uh, now we are shipping this uh, out of tree change in Android 12. So uh, what is this? Basically the idea is that whenever we are opening a file, uh, the Fuse daemon already knows if uh, any extra like Fuse daemon logic needs to be applied to the consecutive read or write or memory mapped operations. So 
if we know that uh, no extra logic is required, then why do that? So at open time, the fuse daemon can uh, execute an ioctal, that is uh, part of the fuse pass through feature that basically just tells, hey, uh, we can do everything that is coming next, especially for the read, write, and memory math operations directly to the lower file system. And this is what, what happens in the fuse driver. So if we see that um, we have a file pointer into the newly added uh, fuse file data structure of, of uh, within fuse, then we would be just forwarding the, the same read, write, or memory map operation to, to, the, to the lower file system. Uh, we would be also using the fuse daemon credentials to keep the same, um, the same security uh, access paradigm as, as fuse. And, but this would happen uh, until we would be closing the fuse file. So there's no way yet to, to, to block the bridge uh, between the, um, the fuse file to the lower file system. And as we can see from this picture, we would be uh, just having a direct bridge between the application fuse driver and uh, lower file system without any, any extra effort from the fuse daemon. And we can see the advantages uh, by, uh, by looking at these benchmarks uh, where for write, random read and random write operations, we, we, have, we are very, very close to the native performance. We are also very close to the sequential read operations but also Fuse, as, as it was before, this change was, was actually great. But this is basically the result of um, the great read ahead um, caching mechanism. So um, as thanks to the feedback, we have some still some issues with Fuse pass-through, so we cannot uh, close it. But with all these benefits, uh, as I mentioned, we are we are using Fuse Pass through in Android, and we would like to extend this with extra features, especially with uh, some very flexible BPF features that Paul is going to to talk about. Okay, next. I don't have to move slides. I do. I can. Okay. I can change your slides. Yes. Thank you. Um, so yes. Um, so having done pass through um, and remembering back to a presentation at uh, XFuse a couple of three years ago, doesn't matter how many years ago that was given given at LPC, um, and and based also on the fact that I've been working on, an, on a stacking pass system for the last couple of years, um, it struck me that you could easily put these three concepts together, not easily. You can put these three concepts together to produce fuse a, sta a stacking fuse with BPF to control what gets passed down and how it gets passed down. Um, so the, the idea is that BPF would be a sort of pre-filter on all requests that could then get passed to the lower file system. Um, and, and you could also pass them, you could pre-filter in user space. Of course, that reduces the, um, the advantage, but then if you only need that some of the time, that would give you most of the advantage you need. Um, so the reason for doing this, as, as Alessio says, is that Android wants to use Fuse. We've tried to use Fuse in multiple projects um, over the years. I counted five when I was um, thinking about this, times we've tried to use Fuse. And all but one of those has been pulled eventually because of the performance issues. And even the one we've shipped, we would like to improve the performance. So Fuse is really something Android wants to use, um, but we, we just can't. Um, and, and whenever we want to use it, we always want to use it as a in a stacking file system mode where we, where we simply want to change some fairly small aspects of what's being read. Um, so making Fuse into a stacking file system natively um, and keeping most of the requests in the kernel using BPF just seems like a very natural thing to do to solve this problem. Um, that's what we're attempting to do. It's, it's very much in the preliminary stages. The soon on LKML is... Um, well, that's how you define soon, I guess. Um, it's a little optimistic, but hopefully, hopefully we'll get something out this year or early next year. Um, I don't plan to go through the detailed architecture, especially since I'm almost out of time. Um, but let's have the next slide. Um, what, what I've been experimenting with is simply adding 
um, a backing inode to an inode and a, and a filter to, to each inode will have a backing inode and a, and a BPF uh, optionally. Um, the existence of the backing inode means you are in this pass through BPF mode. Um, the BPF is called in such situations on all operations, um, passing in essentially the, 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 the fuse args parameter for those who know fuse. Which, so the, the, the BPF gets a chance to look at the, the arguments that fuse would present to user space um, and theoretically modify them and, and also pass them to user space as required. These will then, get, then, then the call will happen to the, to the, to the backing file system. If, if that is what is wanted, there's an option to, 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 to switch back to classic fuse at that point, what I call classic fuse. Um, and then after the pass through, after the pass, the, the backing file system operation has happened, the BPF could, could again inspect the results and make, make a further decision to pass back down to user space. So for example, in the case of redaction, this means we can, we can just let the, 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 read, the read happen and then use, use a, a, a BPF map to decide whether that read happened from an area of the file that needs to be redacted. And only in that situation would the read get passed down to, to the fuse daemon. Um, so you, you only get the performance hit exactly when you need it. So um, that's, I think, this is, yes. If you want to switch to discussion whenever you get the chance, and whenever you're going to segue yes. there. This, this is actually, well, this is the last slide, I believe. Um, so if you just, just pass, quick summary, Fuse pass through, passes through the, an entire file. Um, when, when it has been determined by Fuse, that that file is, is simply going to be the backing file. Uh, um, Fuse BPF is an is a experimental attempt to make this far more, far more granular and use BPF. Oh, by the way, in, with the Fuse BPF, we're using BPF for everything, file operations and directory operations. So that makes a huge difference. And one of the problems we have with Fuse pass-through, well, the biggest problem is, 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 is obvious that directory operations still go to user space. So we still get a big hit, especially when you have a large collection of small files, which is not uncommon in Android and, and every other situation. So questions, comments? Silence. What changes me to Fuse? Um, the main change is that I've written a, a, a macro that implements this entire flow, uh, an inline function. Um, and that's, that has to be inserted just before, at a, at a key, at the right point in each, in each operation. So there's, there's 40 odd Fuse operations. Um, we need to add this macro um, to each of those. It's, it's fairly non-intrusive. That was one of my goals, was to not, not actually change for use much. So that if you're not using this, if you don't want to use this, there will be no impact on the, the, the main flow. All it will actually do is check to see if there's a backing inode. And if there isn't one, it will just carry on with the old, the old path. Um, I mean, I mean, of course, that's not quite true. There's one or two cleanup operations as well added. But, that, but the, the main change, is that hi hi hey you mentioned the uh, directory operations and i might have asked this before on mail by but uh, it's good to repeat it here um so one way is to go to uh, bpf right and one is to continue the fuse path through uh, direction and go to directories and pass through directory operation is this something that you guys are right now considering oh. So, so just to be clear, um, passing through directories really means you're throwing your hands in the air and giving up at that point, which actually actually is really useful in some situations. Oh, don't get me wrong. Why? Because I mean, essentially, essentially at that point, fuse mean? becomes a, fuse becomes a bind mount. There's, I mean, once once you pass through directories, you have no chance. Of, everything will simply be uh, the underlying file system at that point. Or am, I, am I missing something? So Fuse BPF gives, gives us a pass through on directories, but it also maintains control so you can still interfere, interfere, change um, the operations as you want to. Let, let me rephrase that. This is exactly Fuse pass through on directories, but by adding BPF, we, we bring back in a level of control. Am I, am I making sense? I don't know that I am. Alessio, am I making sense? 
<laughs> I, I think I think I think Amir's just posted on chat that he was cut out. Oh, okay, good. Um, not good, but good that it wasn't that I wasn't clear. Yeah. So the pass through on directories, and I mean, certainly in the naive implementation, would simply pass through all directory and all file operations, which is handy once you've decided that this folder is no longer. Um, you just you simply want to essentially bind mount this part of this this tree. Um, but by 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 having BPF by having the option of and it's an option you don't have to have the BPF by having an option of BPF you can maintain control. Um, did that make sense? Yes, that made sense. Yes, Sandy, well put. Any any other questions or any follow up on that question? So I have uh, a question for the audience. So uh, do you actually believe the? So to me, it sounds like natural to have BPF uh, lined together with Fuse, as as long as these are both mechanisms to to let the user space easily interact with the kernel space. So, but do you believe that this solution is would be accepted upstream? So, um, for sure, it would be hard to do that before, before posting that uh, on LKML. But uh, this is still a work in progress, and we are progressing one file system operation after the other. And until we have almost all of them implemented, and it would be hard to to have an MVP ready to be shared. But do you believe this is kind of something that would interest the community. And uh, this is an extension to Fuse Pass through as it was, that would be just being addressing single file pass through. So in that case, the last, uh, the last concern was that we cannot have Fuse Pass through close. And I also tried to implement that uh, by using an extra mapping container, but the, as, as also suggested by Miklos. But the problem in that case is that um, taking as a reference Fuse 2, then it's using IDR and a bunch of other things that were the, um, in our Fuse pass through case, it's much more racy. So uh, we would be need, needing so much extra locking that we would be losing all the performance benefits. So any feedback on what I just said. And, and, and I guess the higher level question is, I mean, Alessio is right. What we're doing currently is we're implementing this, we're adding all the file system operations and um, more and more complete implementation. We would love to know if we're going in the wrong direction. Um, so at what point should we publish and to where is our question? Um, the XFuse work um, seems to not be being maintained as far as I can tell. Um, just to, um, One minute, and uh, as a general reminder, uh, you're welcome to sort of uh, take this up back uh, at the BOF on Friday and continue discussion. Uh, you know, one of the one of the questions that was there uh, from Sandeep, and I think it echoes some of the uh, questions Paul and Alessio were mentioning, which is, you know, uh, are there sort of uh, precedents for this? Uh, are there any rules, examples, or uh, anything of that sort? Um, so I'll, I'll um, sort of encourage people to think about that and, and possibly uh, come back on Friday and discuss this some more uh, fascinating topic for sure. Okay, thank you. Excellent. Thank you guys. All right, David, you've got control. Um, you'll also need to switch your audio to uh, enable your mic. Uh, so I'm going to present. So do I have the presenter lights? I'll give that to you in just a second here. Sure.
All right, initiative control now. All right, uh, I'm not sure if we is working. Uh, not seeing any video at this point. Uh, let me see. Right, um, I'm Akhilesh from the Android community. Uh, I'm going to talk about the uh, snapshots in user space. Uh, all right, a uh, quick recap um, uh, about virtual AV. Uh, Android 11 introduced the concept of virtual AV for OTA updates. Uh, the virtual AV brings in the two features of seamless updates, rollback, and most importantly, uh, you don't need additional space for dynamic partitions. Um, uh, whenever the OTA uh, is being applied, uh, we allocate space dynamically uh, on the uh, data partition. And once the OTA is completed, the reclaimed space is given back uh, to the user. So that's virtually the, as compared to the traditional AV updates. Um, so how do we implement virtual AV? Uh, so we use a uh, DM snapshot in the kernel um, uh, to implement virtual AV, uh, wherein uh, we have the DM linear system base, which is the uh, device which is being snapshotted, and then we have the uh, DM linear uh, cow device, which is the kernel curve format. So on top of that, we create the DM snapshot, uh, then uh, slash system, which is the root uh, uh, root partitions, is mounted off DM variety, which sits on top of DM snapshot. So uh, so once the uh, snapshot target is moved to the merge. Uh, we merge all the uh, curve format delta changes to the um, DMD system base. Um, so that's how uh, we implement virtual AV here. So that's Android 11. Um, now, uh, with with reliance on DM snapshot, uh, one, of the, uh, uh, one of the problems we see is that there is no compression uh, by using the kernel curve format meaning every single block uh, is a replace operation. Um, now, which means that uh, in, the entire OTA package is uncompressed, but if, when, you, when you're using the ATM snapshot in the kernel, you have to uncompress all the OTA packages. And then uh, if, if, the, if the OTA package has new operations, let's say uh, move block X to block Y, uh, each of these move or copy operations is inherently connoted to a replace operation, uh, which ends up uh, eating additional space in the slash data partition. Now, that's the problem we have uh, with uh, using DM snapshots uh, with using kernel curve format. Now, to address this, Android 12 um, introduced, uh, uh, Android introduced the concept of compressed snapshots, uh, wherein we have our own Android curve format, uh, which introduces uh, additional operations, wherein we have a zero ops. Um, then we also have replace ops, wherein the block is replaced, but uh, we do compress uh, uh, using GC compression. And then we also have additional copy operations, wherein we say um, move block X to block Y. Um, so, so, uh, and then the fourth, uh, the recent uh, use operation XOR, where in destination block is just an XOR of the uh, pre-existing block, uh, and then with the change contained in the call file. Uh, with these four operations, uh, we uh, we can uh, we can have better uh, compression ratio uh, as compared to the traditional uh, kernel curve format uh, changes. Um, so, how do we implement? Um, uh, so, so, Android 12 introduced. Uh, the compression. Um, so uh, the, we still continue to use DM snapshot, but the only difference now is that we don't use the um, uh, kernel curve format. Um, now uh, we use uh, DM user, which is a kernel module, something like Fuse for block devices. Um, now the IO from DM snapshot uh, goes to the DM user, which gets uh, routed to the snap user D daemon in the user space. The daemon is now responsible for uh, translating all the I/O requests from DM snapshot, and then um, the translated I/O request uh, is communicated back to the Android curve format. Now this is Android 12, uh, so so this this we use this this brings in full features of compression. Um, 
So, but there are challenges with this. Um, so, so some of the uh, performance numbers for compression is uh, it's it's cool that uh, for for the uh, incremental ODA we see that the compression ratio is about eight uh, x, wherein it gets reduced from four g to about five hundred mb. Uh, so, so all said and done, uh, uh, we we see some few challenges primarily uh, uh, with the snapshot merge time. Uh, we have seen instances uh, wherein the merge time increases. When there are use cases wherein merge time is about 10 to 15 minutes. Uh, even though the merge happens in the background, and users are not impacted, uh, but then still uh, 10 to 15 minutes is a huge time. Uh, and the second problem we see is the complexity of the daemon. Um, the snap user the daemon, which is Handling all the I/O requests from the DM snapshot is inherently very complex. Um, and the third problems we see is the boot time. Uh, since the uh, system partition is uh, mounted off uh, DM snapshot, which is internally mounted on top of DM user, uh, every single I/O request uh, uh, it has to be handled by the daemon. So there is constant you know, switching between user space and the kernel. So, so all these uh, all these are some of the bottlenecks we see with uh, introducing the uh, compressed snapshots. So, to address this, um, what we're trying to do now is uh, we are trying to move, merge the entire snapshot merge to the user space completely. Um, with this, the daemon is, com is completely in control of handling end-to-end -end merging. Uh, uh, so, and there is no DM snapshots now. Uh, we, are not, we are no longer going to use uh, DM snapshot in the kernel. Um, the system partition will directly be mounted up DM user, and then every single IO request will be moved to the uh, daemon. Uh, essentially, what this means is um, the, some of these snapshots handling uh, will be done by the daemon, daemon itself right now. Now, this gives us flexibility, um, wherein the uh, there is no we no longer have uh, constant uh, context switches between user space and the kernel during merge. So uh, we have been experimenting this with the prototype, and we see some uh, at least uh, increments in the merge time for about fifty percent. Um, but still, um, yeah, this is the last slide. Uh, so, but still, uh, we still have the. Uh, um, System partition mounted up DM user, which means that uh, all the I/O requests uh, from the root partition um, will still be rooted to the daemon. Uh, so uh, we still have challenge of improving the uh, boot time regressions. Um, so that's where uh, we are trying to uh, see uh, how efficiently uh, we can optimize uh, some of the DM user increments. Uh, um, so uh, we're trying to see uh, how we could use I/O viewing uh, and integrate it with the snap user DDM and wherein we can cut off some of the uh, system called overheads. Uh, so that's one area we are looking at. Um, uh, one of the uh, other primary reasons why we still stick to the end user uh, and because Neva is not that it gives us the uh, flexibility uh, to switch DM tables under the hood uh, uh, once the IM merge is completed. Uh, and secondly, uh, during boot up process, um, we have a scenario wherein the snap user the daemon have to be uh, paused and switched because we have to enable SE policy. Uh, what this essentially means is that uh, we need some kind of a solution in the kernel wherein the IOs can be queued uh, before which the daemon can completely take over. Now, device map produces that flexibility uh, when when we do uh, when we suspend we can suspend the IOs and then resume back the IOs. So so that's so those are the two two key features of device mapper, and that's one of the primary reasons why uh, we are still sticking to uh, DM user here. But uh, as as you notice, DM user is still out of free. Um, we are hoping for a solution um, to see how close we can be uh, using the upstream features. Uh, one of the uh, primary um, evaluation uh, is uh, feedback we received uh, was why not use NBD network block device. Uh, we have to evaluate that. Uh, now that there is no merge dependency on DM user, 
so we want to see uh, how NVD uses, but as I said, I'm not sure if NVD allows us, uh, NVD uses the flexibility of queuing the IOs in the kernel. That is something which needs to be evaluated. Um, yeah, and that's pretty much it. I'm open, I'm open the floor for any questions if you have. Yeah, so um, I'm just curious uh, if you guys have any other suggestion um, apart from VM user, uh, that would be really great. I mean, we'll we be happy to evaluate that. Um, yeah, uh, NBD, what happened to it, NBD? Yes, uh, NBD network block device, uh, we need to evaluate uh, uh, the overhead of network block device uh, on the boot time. That is something which needs to be done. But as I said, uh, uh, we, uh, we are not sure if NVD uses the flexibility of queuing the IOs uh, when we are switching the daemon in the user space. Because if that is the case, we'll have to go up and, and uh, extend NVD features as well. Yeah, so I think we talked about this some on the upstream. Uh, right, right. Yeah, and I like in theory, we can pass the handle from the, the, the you know the one NVD instance to the other to deal with the SE policy stuff, um, but that's a little bit on the fragile side because it requires orchestrating all these things in the right way. I'm not mm -hmm. yeah, I guess we talked about this yeah. So anyway. Yeah. Yep. Okay, is TM user going to get upstream or recent? Uh, so, uh, so first we need to evaluate evaluate um, other solutions out there, uh, uh, such as NBD there, uh, to get some at least some baseline performance, and um, then uh, we can. Uh, I mean, we can we can uh, check with the uh, device master maintenance to see if. This is something which they'll be interested on uh, to see uh, how efficient VM user is and what is some of the use cases. I mean, this is one of the use cases why we need VM user. Um, so uh, yeah, uh, once we have the uh, baseline performance numbers, we should we should be able to upstream uh, upstream. Yes. Also, there are other interests from uh, a couple of other teams in the. In Google about um, log device in user space, and you know, they are working on upstreaming it. So probably uh, we have to sync with them to see uh, what are their use cases before which uh, we can uh, synchronize um, and see if game user can be used for their use case as well. I'd be excited. Sure. Yeah. Uh, yeah. As I said, uh, certainly. Um, uh, once we have the baseline numbers, because the last time I remember, the uh, user was sent upstream. I think the uh, discussion was cut off, and we wanted to have the performance evaluation done. Uh, that is where I think um, we want to take it further. So, um, yeah, that's the only thing. Have you considered implementing more efficient curl format for DM snapshot? Uh, so, uh, so when you say DM snapshot for the DM snapshot in the kernel, right? Um, so yes. So uh, when uh, compressed snapshot snapshots was being designed, uh, one of the uh, things. So the current Android curl format is extremely specific to Android ecosystem. 
uh, in theory, yes, we could move everything to the kernel and ex extend uh, game snapshot in the kernel itself. Uh, we can we could do that, but we didn't go that route because uh, the core format is too uh, too specific to the Android. And having it in user space, um, we get more uh, control uh, to implement merging as well as the write operations. But um, if, if, there, if there are interests, uh, then yes, uh, in theory, yes, we could move to the, uh, the kernel as well. Yeah, so I think like early in the project, we'd actually consider doing like the cow format directly in the kernel. Um, right. But the Android OTAs are like, very optimized and we wanted to make sure not to introduce a bunch of dependencies between the kernel and the OTA folks and all that sort of stuff. Um, so doing in the user space gives us the flexibility to, you know, like keep that, um, keep that cow snapshot format somewhat flexible because we only need to keep it between boots, right? It's not like a, it's not like a permanent snapshot thing. Um, so it lets us move it around a little bit more. Yeah. I mean, yeah. Yeah, as David just mentioned, yeah, uh, when it's doing like adding new kernel features over OTA in the kernel itself. So, and having it in user Pretty space, much. yeah, having it in user space, the other thing is we have complete control, but then we also have requests uh, from few vendors uh, to have merge verification uh, when the uh, snapshot merge is being done. Those are the things uh, which, uh, which we have more control if we have it in user space. Yeah, David also pointed out letting our user space team yeah, contribute more directly to the uh, you know, snapshot OTA code, um, which yeah. is a big driver because there's a lot of folks there. And you know, getting getting something like this, which is very application logic-y out of the kernel is nice because it lets kind of more people work on it. So that's always a benefit. Yeah. The, the, the DM is nice, but doing it, you know, it's still a little bit hairy if after doing the uh, the DM user stuff, and it's certainly certainly a lot easier to do this in user space. So, yeah, there's a lot of. I mean, now, now that the merge is moved to the user space, uh, the dependency on DM user is very minimal because um, the only IOs which go through DM user is uh, from the root partition, and that too, uh, it, it's it's only visible until the merge is completed. So. Uh, so, so the only optimization we have we need to focus on is improving the boot time performance. That's the only IOS which is served from DM user. But yeah, yeah uh, if, we, if we had our own kernel snapshot, um, we kind of looked into doing one of the snapshot formats, and there would be enough hooks in there that we'd sort of have code sitting around the whole time after boot on that first boot when you spin up, and it, it's nice yeah. to be able to just completely get rid of that. Um, yeah, it, it, it makes things a lot, a lot safer feeling if you can bound the amount of time you're actually running. Exactly. Right. We have one minute and we go for break afterwards. Yeah, sorry, David pointed out in the chat, we considered doing DM, like doing a DM snap user to take the snapshot exception store and put it in user space. I guess we're on break, so. Uh, sorry, I was I was on a chat. No, that's fine, it's good. Thank you for this. Um, so we uh, are sort of officially on break here until uh, 8.35 a.m. Uh, Pacific or 3.35 p.m. UTC, uh, and then when we come back, we'll look at the uh, thermal core usage challenges in Android. All right, thank you, everyone. See you, see you in a short bit. Uh, okay, thanks. So, hello, everyone. Uh, my name is Wei Wang. I'm from uh, Android Pixel performance and small team. 
So today I'm going to talk about uh, some core usage challenges in Android. Basically, like talk about some of the production usage of some of core features of framework provided by upstream kernel. So uh, basically, this talk is about uh, the production use of the Thermocore framework and uh, issues around using it, some pain points maybe, and some source and possible solution to resolve with those pain points. Okay, so uh, like the Android, the whole ecosystem has been uh, using Thermocore infrastructure for both junction temperature and uh, T-skin mitigation and uh, like uh, for, for many, many years. Uh, we have been seeing many uh, thermal DFFS features built around the uh, thermal core uh, by many OEM vendors. So uh, this is a really a core infrastructure, uh, the Android ecosystem used for thermal uh, solution. So here is uh, above like a thousand feet above ground view of the thermal core framework. So it basically has uh, three main components. The thermal zone is for reporting temperature and uh, the coolant wise is for limiting the power. And something in the middle is the thermal governor, which is for control algorithm. For example, we have a IPA contributed by ARM, we have a stepwise, and we have some user space governor. Uh, on the thermal zoom side, uh, there's a couple of uh, types of like different sensors. For example, uh, the junction temperature sensor is used for making sure the chip is running within the spec. It's not burning up like the chip or melting down the board. So the T-skin sensor is usually like, uh, we call this uh, enclosure sensor or ball sensor. It's actually placed uh, very near the enclosure to make sure the user uh, using the device is not being burned. So in the middle is some, some other type of sensor. That's also kind of like a virtual sensor or whatever. That's using the core thermal or thermal core framework. Uh, for example, the BCL, we call the battery current limiting. Uh, it's some sort of like a virtual sensor that makes sure the board or the device is not burned out. And on the coolant device side, usually we have a CPU DFFS control. We have GPU DFFS control and we have a TPU or whatever, the accelerator on the system or on the SOC that can be also uh, doing DFFS kind of like a scaling work. And also we have like some other hardware, uh, flashlight, modem, or even display those high power draining uh, devices or component. Okay, so here I'm going to talk about some problem uh, about like the using the thermal core. So uh, uh, I think I updated the slides. Uh, anyway, uh, I can use this. Uh, so the first, the first problem. Let me actually talk about uh, this. Is the aggregation of the coolant wise volts or basically we call them the interaction between user space governor and other governors. So uh, the SysFS interface for user space governor usually is uh, called uh, the current state under the kernel device uh, device. So many thermal daemons we see like in the user space actually is using that for limiting the power. And also uh, the user space governor or user uh, or thermal daemon or whatever, like the OEM call those solution. They were also pulling or get notified uh, with the thermal zone particularly. But same cooling device can be also used by multiple thermal zone, right? For example, on the junction temperature, it can control the CPU. And uh, T-skin side, which could be used by uh, user space daemon, usually, uh, because it's a slow changing and there's some more complicated rule there. It can also control the CPU power. 
similarly on the PCL uh, side, right? So everything can control the same cooling device uh, thanks to the aggregation happens in the framework, like thermal core framework level. So all the internal thermal zones will have a very good ag aggregation. For example, transient temperature, BCL, if they are using internal thermal zones, the aggregation automatically happen. But if like the, there's a, a user space governor running uh, somewhere and uh, it's rolled through the current cooling state, that will be, uh, the the vote will override whatever the internal someone's own vote and uh bit, basically like the, the both ways right because there's no aggregation methods there so the proposal is quite simple is to add an, another level level like oh aggregation for the user space governor to aggregate like the votes between the user space governor and also uh also other internal governors uh another problem is also related oh, to the wait can i interrupt you could you just go back to the previous slide uh, maybe sort of um and and this is a suggestion it's your it's your presentation but may i suggest that you might want to open it for discussion for the proposal here before moving on to the next problem does that make sense to you or whatever you want um just to sort of uh, suggesting that this might be a good uh, discussion point if that works for you sure uh you know i am open so there's i uh, actually like uh multiple <laughs> things like in, in the slides, uh, you know, like last uh, UCLAM, we didn't really finish all the discussion, but yeah, I think like it's good to have like the open discussion. Uh, let me actually jump into the proposal. So I see actually uh, Daniel is here or someone that has a better proposal or want to have like a discussion about this. Uh, yes, then I'm speaking. Um, so we had already this discussion about the, um, several times with different um, people about this user space governor um, and aggregating the votes. So the the problem is um, I, I I think the um, the using the cooling device to limit the power is is an abuse of the thermal framework. And uh, actually we have the user space. And um, if I understood correctly, the, the, the first thing is the user space governors to get notification from, from the kernel space to have uh, information about the temperature and getting information when the, um, when the time has on cross at a trick point. And, that, and, and for this reason, we have for the same term, for the same sensor, we have one, one um, it's not what we have upstream, but what we find usually in, 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 in some changes for the, for the thermal framework, we have several thermal zones bound to different governors for the same sensor, just for the sake of getting notification and acting on the power on the other side. So <clears throat> that was the, that, that is the reason why we provided the net in notifications in order to to, to get rid of the user space governor for these notifications. And on the other side, um, because we don't want to aggregate between user space and, and, and in kernel governor, uh, uh, we provided a new uh, framework called DTPN, which is based on the power cap framework. And this framework is, is well, uh, tells, well, it speak, speaks by, by itself. It's, um, it's, it allows to, to Cap the power of a device. So, yeah. So we have power numbers here, but we also can use some whatever the power numbers we want to put there. Just a question of consistency. So, yeah. The idea is to, to is to prevent this um, this aggregation from between user space and let that do that from from the kernel between the framework via the dev pm qs. Um, uh, a vote we have we already already have yeah uh yeah thanks like uh so uh i think like i uh like i think like i heard about what you mentioned some of the solution basically using the safe sensor uh both for internal and also user space yes like i also seen some of those but uh here 
uh, let me actually jump back. So here, uh, like the problem we are uh, talking about is actually uh, not uh, just for reusing the uh, the same sensor. So uh, the the basically like the multiple thermal zoom, they are using different sensor, but they are using that for different purpose. For example, the junction temperature is really moving fast, which is uh, T skin. Uh, which on the other hand, like the T skin is slightly like slower than that, which is monitoring the both semester. Uh, both can both the same uh, kernel device interface. But I also heard like the the new uh, framework you were just talking about, uh, which may be targeting for this uh, aggregation uh, aggregation problem, right? Um, okay, so let me jump about the some link net link configuration. So uh, as just like discussed, uh, there's some thermal link. Uh, feature that built upon like new upstream support for making the thermal daemon in the user space get like more information or precise information from the uh, thermal zone, which is like basically getting the input of the temperature. So uh, on that side, uh, we also have some uh, protection uh, pain points of that. So right now, all the thermal zoom can generate messages, uh, and uh, we, we have like some some kinds of like different types of uh, messages, but those are quite spammy. Uh, mostly, the user space thermal daemon is interested in those slowly changing signals. For example, T skin, the junction temperature moves really fast, which is uh, basically like the temperature can jump multiple like uh, tens of like Celsius degree this in a couple of like millisecond in high demand workload right but t-skin is really like multi-seconds moving slowly moving so that makes sense for the user space uh, as a daemon to monitor that so uh but all the information generated to the user space is quite uh, overwhelming because there always been multiple thermos one in terms of like, the junction temperature and uh, T skin and other BCL thermal zone. Uh, and think about the, the next slide is a, a proposal to filter or configuration on the messages. Uh, so uh, that's uh, what we put as a product of work on, uh, in some product. We have to do this. Uh, but I want to hear maybe there's some better ways about uh, doing uh, the future of the, the network information. Um, so, a question. So you have, you're proposing that you will add some filtering to the netlink uh, requests that you're proposing? Uh, like you, on the, you, yeah, on the, on the thermal zone, basically. Some thermal zone, uh, we can completely mute it because that's irrelevant to user space. So user space, when they set up, it can particularly just monitor specific thermal zone, a specific type of message even. So, so, so do, I think the current netlink allows you to get notification when you cross a passive trip point, right? Uh, yes, uh, but some of the soon like they, they may, uh, like happen that that happens too often, for example, the junction temperature. So you get, uh, like a tens of like those information from the user space and wake up, like basically, uh, those message are not even interested in the user space level because, uh, on the junction temperature, uh, it's, it's usually too moving too fast for user space as a solution to make any adjustment. Yeah, the, there'll be always an issue when two different agents are trying to control the same device. Right. <laughs> That's uh, <it. laughs> 
yes like that's why right like on the android side or oh, whatever right like uh as i mentioned right the junction temperature usually usually like is either in the firmware level or in the kernel level uh i seldom see anything like on the on the on the user space due to the reason of is a fast changing uh, sensor so yeah could be uh, there is some solution that's built around the <laughs> user space and can also monitor like the junction temperature yeah you know like in for for at least for intel devices we you know like particularly like t-skin which has very you know lot lot of hysteresis uh, we don't even have any thermal you know we don't put any thermal zone inside for those sensors because it's and we disable it even if it is there right so so, so your your issue is you want to cool the same device with one with a fast you know one which is fast reactive and one with the slow reactive mode right yeah uh, we have actually more than some some devices they have like even 20 different thermal zones for various things right for example, uh, modem for, for, for you know, like there, there's a really, really a lot of like uh, thermal sensors and uh, user space uh, usually just uh, interesting, interested like in one of those or maybe two or several, but not entirely the, the every thermal zone. But some of the thermal zone, they, they move so fast and basically the user space has to, has to be, you know, waking up like due to the current supply. Um, so, so you want looks to like Daniel? Looks like Daniel has been trying to say something. Maybe you want to give him a chance to talk. Yeah, I, just I want to, to to understand what kind of notification you want you need. Uh, I think like we sh we we should you know uh, filter uh, on the types of like the information. For example, the, oh, I think we are running out of uh, time. You got three minutes, go ahead. Okay, sure, thank you. So basically like I don't think like filter on the type of like information uh, for the sensor is uh, reasonable. Like maybe we should just keep all the things. Uh, usually is the, the type of the sensor is, uh, is basically the, uh, the most, uh, Factor that affecting how spammy it is. For example, on the on the faster sensor or slow sensor, which is could be junction temperature or could be skin sensor by nature. Okay, I understand. Thank you. All right, thank you. So I'm not sure we can cover all the things. Uh, the next topic is about the loadable module on the uh, governor side. So since like thermal governor is part of the GKI, uh, and uh, there's no module support for governor, or in you know, one image, it will result like a larger code. Uh, but that's, that's what it is. Uh, on the other hand, uh, usually in the product, things are not perfect. So there's always been complex rules about the different threshold, even combination of multiple governors. Sometimes I see that used in in some product and also there could be product workaround uh, so i also see some of the product workaround is implementing like the small governor inside a small sensor driver which is uh, involving very complex uh, lot usage on the small zone side coolant wide side and also the driver itself and also separate like, the trip setting. I think like essentially that's a uh, wrong usage. It's probably better to be make like the governor notable. Uh, the last one is virtual sensor support. Uh, there's good good usage on the uh, on the virtual sensor of fusion fused the sensor uh, in the user space and also in the kernel. So it would be good to have like that support. Uh, I think like this. Uh, we, we're going to have to switch, but uh, you're welcome to pick this up back on Friday and continue the conversation then. Sure. Yeah. Thank you very Thank much. You. All right. That's all like for the slides. Thank you.
All righty, here we go. Uh, hi everyone, uh, my name is Hridhya Valsiraju. I work in the Android kernel team. Uh, and today I'm here to talk to you about a new DME buff memory accounting feature that we have been uh, looking into for Android. Uh, in the next few slides, I would like to uh, walk you through the various solutions we explored. Uh, and the, at the end of the presentation, uh, it would be great to hear your thoughts and have a discussion on how we can best implement the feature in an upstream friendly manner. Uh, so the problem that we are trying to solve is that currently we do not have a way to limit the total amount of DME buff memory that is allocated on the behalf of a process. Uh, this means that a faulty, uh, a faulty process is free to continue allocating DME buff memory until the device falls under uh, memory pressure. So uh, to solve the problem, we would like a way to implement allocator attribution for DME buffs in Android uh, so that we can set an upper limit for how much DMA buff memory can be allocated on behalf of a process. Uh, so the first solution we explored uh, was the memory controller, uh, was the MemCGC group controller. Um, however, with the per process C group hierarchy that Android is currently using, when we enabled MCG, uh, when we enabled MemCG, there was a noticeable overhead on some use cases. So all Android partners were are not really on board with uh, making uh, with enabling MemCG on their production devices. Uh, additionally, MemCG performs accounting in units of page uh, in the DMA buff buffer sharing model. Uh, process takes a reference to an entire uh, DMA buff, keeping it uh, alive, uh, even if it is only accessing parts of it. So uh, per page memory tracking feels like an unnecessary overhead for uh, DMA buff memory accounting. Uh, also, for our use case, there is no need to use C groups to track which processes are holding FD or MAP references uh, to a DMA buff, since we already have that information available in PROCFS. So for the use case of allocator attribution uh, of DMA buffs, we don't, we don't really think that uh, the memory controller C group uh, is the right way to, uh, memory C group controller is the right way to go. Uh, so the next solution uh, we explored was whether we can have a user space uh, service that keep tracks of all DMA buff allocations and releases. Uh, so we, we, we found a couple of issues with this approach. Uh, the main one was that we could not find a sure shot way for the user space service to intercept all allocations and releases because allocations in Android, DMA buff allocations in Android happen through uh, the DMA buff heap ioctils. And a DMA buff is of course released when the last reference to it is dropped. So uh, it would be very hard to have a user space service intercept all allocations and releases. Uh, moreover, even if we were to have uh, such aggregation happening in a user space service uh, on the in the event that uh, the process gets killed or restarted for some reason, we would lose all accounting uh, so far. So uh, those are the issues that we faced with uh, the solution. Uh, so the next solution we explored is the uh, GPU C group controller that is under construction upstream. Uh, it seemed like a, a good fit for our use case. And uh, in the next few slides, uh, we can, uh, I, I, I can walk you through uh, our evaluation 
of the C group controller for usage in Android. Okay, so uh, since since the GPU C group controller was actually created uh, for the upstream GPU drivers, uh, the API from the last is latest uh, RFC is actually closely tied to the DRM framework. Um, this is unfortunately a problem for Android devices because in Android, uh, all DMA buffs get allocated by the heap drive, DMA buff heap drivers. So, uh, so, uh, but it, if the uh, original authors of the uh, C group controller are on board, uh, and they don't mind doing it, it should be easy enough to uh, change the API to be generic though, uh, to decouple it from the DRM framework. Uh, so yeah, basically we would need the API to be a bit more generic for to allow it to be used by uh, the DMA buff heap drivers. Okay, so the next issue we faced with using the uh, GPU C group controller for in Android is not really specific to the GPU C group controller. It mostly relates to the way uh, DMA buffs are allocated in Android. So in Android, the majority of DMA buffs are allocated in the uh, allocated by a process known as the graphics allocator HAL or the Graloc HAL as we call it. Uh, so um, multiple clients would request the Graloc HAL for an allocation over IPC with specific requirements and constraints. And uh, the Graloc allocator HAL process would uh, do the allocation, keeping in mind the various constraints and send the DMA buff FD back to the client over IPC. So this is how the majority of DMA buffs get allocated in Android. However, this means that uh, if we were to charge every DMA buff to the process which allocated it, we would not have effective uh, allocator attribution for DMA buffs in Android because the Graloc allocator HAL uh, would be on the hook for the majority of DMA buffs that were allocated. So uh, to get over this problem, we would actually need a way to charge a DMA buff uh, to, a, uh, to a C group other than that of the allocating process. So uh, we explored a few different ways that we could do that. So the first solution that we explored was whether we can use the C group interface itself uh, to do such a thing. So for example, the allocating process could write the DMA buff FD to a file in the client uh, in the to the to a file in the client's client processes C group, uh, the allocating process would of course know who the client was. It would need to know who the client was to do such a thing, and uh, yeah. However, we uh, ran the interface by uh, C group maintainers, and they did not feel that the interface was very upstreamable because it really differs from it. It does not match with how uh, resource accounting is currently done in the existing C group controllers. So it did not seem like this was the way to go. Uh, so uh, the next option uh, we explored was uh, whether we could introduce a new DMA buff heap uh, ioctil uh, that would take as argument uh, as uh, the FD to the C group of the client process. So uh, what would happen here is that in the IOCTL handler, uh, the heap driver could check whether the client's uh, allocation limit has already been met. And if it has not been met, it will proceed with the allocation and charge uh, the buffer to uh, the client C group. And, uh, and if the charge has already been met, it would fail the allocation. Uh, so uh, we would use SC policy so that only uh, SC policy restrictions to ensure that only approved processes can use the new IOCTL, uh, the new DMA buff heap IOCTL. Uh, uh, another solution that we briefly looked into was 
to uh, we looked into whether we can figure out a mechanism similar to f advice no don't need where uh, the allocator process can say that it will not be accessing this dma buff at all and then the dma buff would get charged to the first process who accesses it uh, however uh, with due to the shareable nature of dma buffs uh, we did not think that the results would with such a scheme would be deterministic uh, for example the process who receives the fd over ipc from the allocator process might not map or install the fd and pass it over to another process so it really does not uh, fit into our use case of setting an upper limit for the dma buffs which were allocated on behalf of a process so we kind of uh, yeah we we just did not think that it would work out uh, so these are the various options that we explore to figure out how to charge a dma buff uh, to a process other than that of the allocating process. Uh, so yeah, if you have, uh, if you can think of any other approaches that we can try uh, to implement the feature, or if you have any thoughts at all, uh, we'd be happy to collaborate. Uh, so yeah, that brings us to the end of the presentation. Thank you. Uh, questions? So I, I don't mean to put people on the spot. Um, I, I do see there's a few of the folks uh, who are in the, um, the C group proposal are in attendance here. So I don't know if Kenny or uh, anyone else has any comments. Might be good to hear. Uh, yeah, I, I think we, um, we talked on email before. Uh, I, I'm okay with option two. Um, but I think it sounds like we want to separate out the, uh, the C group control functionality from the GPU C group into maybe a DMA buff C group potentially. Is that, is that, uh, what you're suggesting? Uh, uh, yeah, yes, Kenny. So yeah, just like we discussed over email, uh, we would like to make the API a little bit more generic. So, uh, other DMA buff exporters. Uh, can also use it. Uh, so yeah, uh, I would actually be okay with uh, going with option two as well if the DMA buff and DMA buff heat maintainers have no issue with uh, going that way. So uh, then, yeah, I think th I think that should be a workable solution too. So um, I don't know if it's uh, <clears throat> relevant or not, or if I, even if I understand the problem properly. But um, have you can uh, would eBPF fit in there somewhere? Uh, so uh, we looked into eBPF, uh, Karim. Uh, uh, so the problem we found with uh, so I, I'm assuming you're talking about adding trace points and uh, eBPF hooks to uh, uh, eBPF maps to have uh, aggregate the accounting, right? So uh, the last time we looked at, looked into it, we did not. Uh, so eBPF uh, programs, they were not supporting locking. So uh, yeah, concurrent updates were an issue with uh, eBPF maps. So that's why we decided not to go with uh, the eBPF map approach. Okay, thanks. Um, we got about five minutes left, so um, 
if anybody else wants to pitch in, that now's a good time. Because I'll just ask the question of uh, how far out do you think you'd be from submitting a, a patch for the list for something like the option two? Uh, so, uh, John, uh, for us to go with option two, uh, we still need the first part uh, to be done in collaboration with uh, the GPUC group uh, controller uh, where we modify the API to be generic. Uh, so that the DMA buff heap driver can um, use it. So I guess our next step would be to uh, follow up with the owners of the GPUC group uh, controller. And uh, if they are okay with making the API generic, then we can, uh, uh, I, we will be happy to collaborate with them or take up the task of making the API generic or helping them in whatever way they want to get it done. So I guess that that's the next step for us right now. So there's uh, another microconference on Friday uh, yeah. around C group um, for GPU resources. So maybe that's another topic that uh, can be discussed there as well. Yes, yes, Kenya. Yeah. So I'm planning to attend uh, that one too. So yeah, maybe this is something we could discuss there as well. Okay, so um, maybe you want to switch to slides. Okay, perfect. Um, so we're open to sort of uh, taking this up again on Friday, uh, if need be. Um, thank you a lot, Heredia, uh, for, for the presentation there. Thank you, Gary. Yep. Okay, can you guys hear me? Yep, loud and clear. Well, I'll wait for uh, 9.15 this time. Yeah, perfect. Thank you.
Okay, it looks like it's 9.15 at least on my clock, so I'll start. Um, hello everyone, I'm uh, Saravana Kannan from the Android Common Kernel team. I'm here to talk about firmware devlink, uh, what's, what are the remaining issues and what future improvements uh, we could get from it. Uh, to do a quick status update, um, since uh, the last LPC, firmware devlink is now on by default, I think since 5.13. So that means it starts enforcing probe and suspend receive monitoring uh, based on the dependencies it has uh, gathered from DT. And to do that, it supports currently 23 common DT bindings. And there are about uh, 55 or more patches uh, since the last LPC. Uh, the changes that went in are basically uh, to improve uh, handling of cyclic dependencies. So it automatically notices a cycle and uh, doesn't try to enforce the ordering because it doesn't have any additional details. And it also does a better handling of early devices that are needed for the, you know, to bring up the CPUs and whatnot really early on in the boot process, uh, like clocks and uh, whatnot. And then it has a better handling of cases of uh, missing drivers. Um, and then it supports, it has support for uh, optional dependencies. Uh, so there's a, for example, like IMMUs and DMAs and um, now, because of these IRK drivers, can now be platform drivers and they can be modules and upstream. Um, I talked about better handling of uh, cases of missing drivers. So I want to get into that a bit more because it sets up the discussion later. So consider this dependency graph. Uh, a is the supplier of B, B is the supplier of C, and C is the supplier of D. And uh, in this uh, system, uh, there's not going to be any driver for A. So um, by the time deferred probe timeout happens, the timeout expires, there's no driver for A. That's, just, that's the case we are talking about. And B has an optional dependency on A so that if A is not probed, B can still continue probing. Uh, with firmware devlink equal to off or permissive, uh, which is how it used to be before, uh, once a deferred probe timeout expires, when B tries to get a resource from A, it's going to get uh, E no dev or similar error instead of getting E probe deferred. So B will stop probe deferring and will actually complete probing. So this much was guaranteed with the firmware devlink equal to off or permissive. Um, but what it didn't guarantee is that C and D could well, could fail probing even though they could have successfully probed because they depend on B and like C, uh, D depends on C. So once B probes, they really should be able to probe, but that's not guaranteed to that or with firmware devlink equal to off. That's because um, C and D could be attempted after the timeout, but before B is probed. So in that case, they'll get an E node of error and then they'll just fail to probe. Uh, with firmware devlink equal to on, it kind of guarantees that B, C, and D will probe once the timeout expires. Uh, that's because firmware devlink on will enforce the ordering of probe between B, C, and D. So B will probe first. You'll see that uh, A isn't there. It'll continue probing and then C will be attempted and then B will be attempted. So in that sense, it, it improves handling of uh, cases where there are no drivers. Uh, quickly, these are the 23 bindings that are currently supported. The last uh, five of them were added this year, I think, or since last LPC. Uh, going on to discussion slides, uh, the first topic I wanted to discuss is um, fully asynchronous probing. Um, since firmware devlink completely disconnects driver initialization order or driver registration order from device initialization order, it allows us to uh, do asynchronous probing uh, in a much more reliable way. So what you see here is basically a graph that the x-axis is time, the y-axis is the CPU number, so it's like 0, 1, 2, uh, 3, 4, 5, 6, 7, 8. If it's white, it means the CPU is idle. If it's any color, then it means CPU is actually busy. Darker the color, the more busy it is. That's what the graph is trying to show. Uh, and this uh, the part is kind of circled is uh, the time where we uh, load the modules and the devices get probed. So by the default asynchronous probing scheme, that whole thing took about 900 milliseconds. So when we kind of hacked up the uh, kernel or we actually went and changed all the drivers to enable asynchronous probing, uh, we were able to actually probe successfully and get to a functional system, like the, the phone would boot the home screen and things would work. And it cut down the initialization time for that part of loading the modules and probes from by 50%. So it goes from 900 milliseconds to 450 milliseconds. And then we want to try to take it a step further where we basically loaded all the modules in parallel. 
um, and it kind of in a sense gave uh, asynchronous probing for free because um, every probe is done in the context of the thread that's loading the module. Uh, with that, we were not able to get a fully functional system, but it did cut down the time to 250 milliseconds. I think the reason we didn't get to a fully functional system is because there are some issues in the error handling and the drivers, uh, in the downstream drivers. So I don't think that's anything uh, that can't be fixed. It sh should definitely be fixable and uh, 250 milliseconds should be a reachable goal. And you can see from the graph how the, the work is kind of getting more uh, compression to a shorter time frame and more parallelism. So my first question here is, what can be done? Or uh, my goal is to try to enable fully asynchronous probing for at least DT-based systems in upstream. So do people have thoughts on this? One caveat with this is uh, right now there's no global flag to enable asynchronous probing by default. So that would be something I would like to add to the kernel command line. Any thoughts, Greg, Rob, anyone else? That would certainly be the first step to uh, get anyone to use it. Adding the command line, you mean? <laughs> yeah. Okay. Yeah, that's going to cause, that'll be interesting to see what happens. Um, yeah, okay. it'll be fun to watch. Yeah, I, I'm really curious. I would think the upstream would be in a much better state. I would, so I'm expecting this to succeed in upstream, we'll see. I, yeah, I, I, mean, swear I, I want to see it. I want to see it happen. I, yeah. I'm pretty sure that there was some flag. I, I experimented a bit with async probing by default, and I, I did manage to find a flag to turn it on by default. I think I had to search a bit. I even that through yesterday. I couldn't find any. Uh, basically, you can have common command line to enable a uh, driver at a time, but you have to list the driver names, and the number of drivers you could list is limited by 256 characters. But I'd be happy was, to. I managed to get something that turned it on by default, and I don't think I had to hack the code for it. But uh, I'll look again for you. Uh, yeah. But it didn't. It didn't boot. But it did seem to turn them all on by default. Yeah, I'm not sure when we tried it, but maybe with some double link equals on, maybe it'll boot. If it doesn't, we can kind of look into it. There was an option. I thought we should. I thought we had it a long time ago. Enabled. Maybe that's a per bus issue. Okay, yeah, we can, yeah, I think, I, this. I think PCI uh, could handle that and we made it a bus option. Uh, uh, maybe. Okay, so people seem okay with this idea, so I'll start kind of sending out patches for this in the future. I'll go on to the next discussion. One more question for you. Uh huh. You mentioned for parallel module loading that it wasn't fully functional and you thought it was probably some driver issues. Um, is there a possibility that asynchronous probing will face the same problem? You just didn't hit it just by circumstance of, of timing? It's possible circumstance of timing is hiding some issues, but um, in the cases where we do, did see failure, they were like very obvious bad error handling code and modules. So that's pretty much those in. So I think basically it can be fixed if you fix error handling. Uh, so in that case, it it might be useful to actually, at least on an experimental or development basis, do some allow the parallel module loading to discover those errors and. Oh yeah, we're definitely we're doing that. Yeah, it's not. I haven't dropped out on that attempt. The goal is to get there, but I think asynchronous probing at at a minimum that should be more feasible. Yeah. Okay. Thanks. Does uh, parallel module loading require any kernel change? It doesn't actually. Um, yeah, it didn't need any kernel change. Um, have, you looked at, have you looked at uh, parallel init calls? <laughs> no, that that's what I see. Well, parallel init calls. No, that's effectively kind of what it's doing, right? Parallel module loading, it's just moving the init calls after late and, it, and then you're doing them in parallel. That's right. What it's doing. But it, then it would help the static uh, kernel case. Yeah, it, it would. That would be interesting. I'll first get asynchronous probing working, and then I'll look into a parallel init calls. I did look at my old notes on this, and you're right. Uh, my last note said that there was no no flag to turn this on by default. Um, one thing I will note that I remember running into is you're going to run into some device ID problems. So 
when I turned this on, I turned this on for all MMT devices uh, at Ulf's request, and then it broke MMC device numbering, and that was sort of the, the final straw to add MMC device number aliasing into the kernel, uh, and, and some people yelled a bit about that. But uh, there is another one that I didn't solve, which is uh, MTD device numbering will also get thrown for a loop because again, it uh, depends on probe ordering. And when you start asynchronously probing, that, that gets totally changed. So we'll that's have good. to solve that too. But that's a good problem. Device numbering should, should never be deterministic. It should always- Oh, sure. I, I, it's a good problem, but it, it, people will need to solve it. I tried adding it for MTD and it actually got reverted because there were lots of people relying on the MTD numbers and there was no uh, support for fixing the numbers. So for MMC, there was a way to fix the numbers and that kind of got people out of their buying. Uh, for MTD, there was not. Well, what's using the numbers today? Who relies on these numbers? It's, it's not a user space thing. It's user space usually. Uh, I can go look up the, the patch for you if you'd like. So, I mean, we, we created UDEV for this 15, 20 years ago for that reason. <laughs> No one wants to do that. They just it's, add more DT aliases so they get their nice fixed numbers. No, well, no, no, no. Respect. Do not, do not accept that. That's not okay. Uh, well, the the fixed numbers no. actually are are really, really convenient in a lot of cases when the user manual itself refers to something by number, and then having the numbers the same in the kernel really, really keeps your mind from having to work really hard. So, but the numbers for instance, are, I mean, that's what, I mean, people, I mean, we've done it through bust, bust, bust all the way. We have PCI device numbers reorder on the phase of the moon, right? Um, sure. Network devices, USB devices, these are not deterministic numbers. They never right, should be, but, that's why we. But, but for things that are built into the, into the SOC, like when you read the, the user manual of the SOC and it says, Here's MMC one. Here's MMC two. Here's MMC three. And then you read the the boot log, and it says MMC two maps to MMC one. MMC three maps to MMC zero. And so just, then, I mean, we have the same problem with ETH zero and ETH one being presented on the front of of servers, right? <laughs> so, I mean, it's the okay, same. Right? It's the same. ETH zero and ETH one were printed printed on the front panel of servers. I mean, and, and I mean, this is not a new problem. <laughs> Yeah, uh, and you, you can solve this by attaching a text label to the thing without making it also be the device number. Right, uh, getting a text label would be Solve the problem ideal in a more general way that. because sometimes the uh, the labeling that you see in the manual, it doesn't fit into the format Linux uses. So I think but, a I mean, text label that user space, But MMC0 isn't go out as the device that user space directly accesses, correct? Um, sorry, quick time check. Do I have right, so how many more? Anyway, right. the, the point is that should not be an issue. Renumber them randomly. Let people figure it out. We have the tools that, to handle it. The ship has already <laughs> sailed on DT, and it's not just the kernel that uses them. Uh, uh, U-boot actually uses more cases than the kernel. Uh, I just want to second uh, Saravana's intervention there. So um, just a time check there. So we, I, I think there are more issues to be discussed, and, and I think this yeah. would be good to pick up on Friday. So go ahead, Saravana. Yeah, they have only five more minutes or ten more minutes? You've got six minutes to go. And then questions five more, right? Six, yeah, six, six minutes total. So um, uh, it's your time to whatever you want. Okay. So uh, the next one is the case of booting with missing driver. So with format doubling equal to on, let's look at the case of ace one that never has a driver in upstream. It's not even an upstream. Um, and then B has an optional, B is actually listing A as a supplier in DT, but driver of B also never tries to get any resource from DT. So this is the combination, does D probe. With format doubling equal to not on, it'll probe all the time. With format doubling equal to on, if config models is not enabled, it'll probe. But models is enabled, it doesn't throw. Obviously, because former doubling doesn't know if it needs to wait longer for the module to show up or not. So a couple of ways you can get around this and get D to probe. One obvious one is set different probe timer equal to one. It'll notice, oh, it doesn't have a driver, it'll stop enforcing, we will probe. Or I can add another uh, time mode uh, thing and set the default to one. One problem with this is if you have a fully modular kernel, 
That's where firmware devlink equal to on would help the most. This will effectively make firmware devlink uh, useless because of the default will just cancel firmware devlink after this timeout and it'll be useless. Another option is to uh, set up a timer for five seconds after which firmware devlink will stop enforcing, but then you extend it each time <laughs> you load a module. So are there other ideas? What, the, what should be the response to people saying, hey, this is breaking my case. Should we ask them to use default probe timeout one? Default probe timeout one. Rob, I guess it would be the first one I want to ask. I can re-explain it if it's too fast. If you're talking, you're muted, Rob. Well, the, the timeouts always had problems. When we've tried to set it. But that's why I gave the other info earlier. So it's time is a lot better now. It's not just gonna blindly fail everybody. It's only gonna fail, uh it's just only gonna allow uh or deal with this where there's no driver at all registered at that point. Some systems take a really long time to get to module loading. I I know, so that's what I'm trying to. <laughs> it's like picking uh, picking like five is going to be absurdly low for some systems, and it's going to be absurdly. Yeah, but why you extend? Okay, yeah. If you're seeing the first module loading is going to take longer than five seconds, yeah, it's going to be a problem. I'm just that's just a number, but yeah, yeah. It's like we, yeah, we we probably just need to say like set a value though rather than set uh, this particular number. Uh, yeah, yeah, that's what I meant. Yeah, clear. Be... There's nothing magic about the number. We just made it up. Correct. And then it will be configurable. Uh, but is there's a third option of setting it and extending it better than other two options? Any thoughts? Well, the only thing I've thought of is having some sort of file you can write to say I'm done with module auto loading. Yeah, I've, I've suggested that before as well. But then, yeah, the default case would still not work, though, right? For the cases it, where. It, it... It, it would mean you could ha you could arrange for a good handover from current uh, from current uh, user space boot, uh, or for, you know from the kernel boot to user space though. Because at the minute, the reason you want a timeout is because we don't really know when user space is finished doing its initial go at things. Whereas if if user space can say, "Hey, I'm done now. Anything else? I'm not loading any more modules without something happening," then it at least progresses things. Yeah, I know, I understand, but then what do we do about this case? It'll still, by the default, if you don't make any user space changes, you're going to like block the probe of B. And there are a few cases like this in upstream um, where there's no driver for A either. So I feel like we need some sort of way of annotating that as properly optional, because just using timeouts for the optional links, mm -hmm. I feel like is the problem that we had before. And so if there's some way that the driver can say, hey, this link is really optional, we don't care. Mm -hmm. Can we annotate that? <laughs> would that be okay? Yeah. Maybe yeah. Be a, one second. Would it be a chosen node thing where you could say, "Hey, these are all devices that Linux doesn't know how to do," and then I can just go through that and figure it out? Is that will that be an option? I see there's only one or two minutes left. Thanks. Thanks. Yeah, we're about to flip. So, whatever you want. Okay. By the way, please join the, the birds of feather like on Friday. We can continue to talk a lot about this. Please. One yeah, you still have one minute to go. Go ahead, Rob. Sorry. Asynchronous probe, uh, you'll have another problem here because then your NIT calls being done aren't related to your probing being done. Please attend the for buff. Thank you. Yeah, I think we're at the uh, um, the the next presentation, which was the um, Android drivers in Rust. Winston, give you control. Hi, can you can you hear me? Yep. All right, let me share here my screen. All right, so perfect. Yeah, I think I think we can get started, right? It's 35. 
Um, so, uh, hello everyone. Uh, my name is Watson. I am a uh, software engineer working on the Android platform security team. Um, what I wanted to talk to you about today is um, writing um, Android drivers in, in Rust. Uh, so what I'd like to do is actually show you um, a few examples of, of, of uh, snippets. I'll show you some, some C code and then some uh, Rust code, equivalent uh, Rust code. Um, and I'll show you some examples. And these examples come from, from um, our work in porting a GPIO driver and uh, NVMe driver. The GPIO driver is, is published and, and available for all to see. The NVMe driver is not published yet. Uh, we plan to, to publish it soon. Um, and then after I show you some, some of these snippets and we don't have to go through all of them, uh, I'll open up for, for discussion uh, and I'll have some questions that uh, um, we may discuss. Um, so uh, the, the, the first snippet uh, I'd like to show is, is uh, how you declare a driver. Um, this is how we do it in C. Um, we all know how uh, this is done. This is a real example from the PL061 uh, GPIO driver. Um, and here on the right is how you do the same thing or similar thing in, in, in Rust. Um, we, we also have a, a, a macro similar to, to the one we have in C here. Um, the, the syntax is, is, is a little bit different. Um, um, most fields here are similar. Uh, author is not here on the left side, but um, it would be like module author and some name. Uh, but the key difference here is that we have this type, PL061 device, um, which we uh, implement some traits for, which I'll show in the next slide uh, in Rust. Um, so here's how, how in C you would implement your, your device ID table and uh, your, you declare your probe function that was referenced in the, in the driver in the, in the previous slide. Um, in Rust, you do it this way. Um, you implement this Ember driver, um, Ember is, is the bus. Um, um, you implement the straight uh, and the straight is like an interface uh, in Rust. So the, the, the core kernel uh, creator defines this, this uh, interface uh, and then drivers for this bus uh, implement this interface, which is called the trait in, in, in Rust. Um, well, one thing that I'd like to point out here is that um, the, the, the state is all typed uh, so in C, the, the, and it's not highlighted here, but the idea in C is that um, you, you uh, allocate some state uh, for, for this device that is being probed, and then you save it uh, as, as driver data on the device. Um, in Rust, you would allocate the, the state and you'd return it, uh, and that would be stored uh, in, in, as driver data, which is untyped in C, but is all typed in, in, um, in Rust. Another thing that I'd like to show here on this on this um, slide is that we have a type here that specifies where the the power operations come from if they are implemented uh, by this driver. In this case, we're saying self, that it, so it's coming from the same um, type from the same PL061 device. Um, um, here, here's here's uh, a, a little bit more details on how you declare a uh, 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 device ID uh, table and um, how you attach data to it. Uh, in Rust, we, we allow the, the, the data attached to each device ID to be typed. Uh, in fact, we require it for, for, for memory and type safety. Uh, and here, um, uh, in this example here, we have uh, U64 as the type, um, an example with a type, uh, with data, another example without data, and uh, we, you don't have to no terminate uh, your list. So it's uh, one, one less uh, source of potential problems. Uh, and then in your probe uh, function, you get an optional XT4 in this case, um, which is the same type as this. Uh, if you actually had several um, IDs here that had the different types of payloads that needed to be attached to, then you could define an enum uh, with, with data in, in them, uh, which is also supported. Uh, um, uh, another snippet here, power management. This is how it's done in PL061. Um, this is how it's done in, in, in Rust. Um, you can see here that in, in, in the C version, we have this if def. Um, if, if a PM is not defined, then this thing don't even get compiled in, in C. In Rust, we don't really need to do that. Uh, this happens automatically. You can just define your code. And uh, if PM is not defined, the, the code will not make it to the final binary uh, in the end. Uh, similarly to, to, to uh, the previous examples, so you, you implement a, a trait. In this case, power operations is the trait. And then um, um, 
as as in previous cases too, uh, the, the payload, uh, the, the context of, of, of the power state is also typed. So you don't have to, to cast, uh, and there's, there's no chance here for you to, to cast to the wrong type. Um, um, another snippet here is how you do uh, IRQ uh, registration. Um, on the left again, uh, how, how you do it in C. Uh, on the right, how you do it in, in, in Rust. Um, most of the stuff is, is, is quite similar. The way you format things is slightly different. It's actually typed in, in uh, Rust. Um, one thing that I like to call out here is the is these extra the context that you attach to do your IRQ handler in in C it's it's untyped so it's NVMe Q here uh, it, it gets uh, it, it, uh, cast to 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 void star basically uh, in Rust that, that that's not the case uh, so so in this case it's ref counted so we clone we increment the ref count here and we pass it to the um, to the um, IRQ registration. Uh, and then what we get back, we actually get back a this thing that represents an IRQ registration that actually gets automatically uh, unregistered when the object owning it uh, is destroyed. Uh, so this is uh, an example of, of automatic cleanup, cleanup um, in, in, in Rust. Um, here's how the, the handler uh, would be implemented. Uh, this is the C version. Um, the Rust version, again, we have IRQ handler uh, trait that uh, one would implement. Um, and here again, um, we have uh, typed uh, data associated with the with the handler, and and this is guaranteed to be alive. If if the IRQ handler has been called, then we know that this is alive, uh, because the the unregistration is the one that uh, decrements the ref count on this uh, referenced uh, NVMe uh, queue. Um, it's not really directly related to the IRQ handling, but um, we use an enum to 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 return. Um, the status of the of the IRQ handler, and uh, there's no coercion uh, from integers to 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 enums in Rust, so they need to be explicitly uh, returned as as enums. Um, another example that I'd like to show uh, is 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 locking. Um, 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 in, in, so this example comes from the NVMe driver. Um, here on the left again we have the C, and on the right we have um, um, the Rust code. Uh, in C, we have an explicit spin lock and spin unlock uh, in the end. Uh, in Rust, we have this uh, self inner dot lock uh, that gets automatically unlocked when it goes out of scope. So in this case, uh, down here, if we wanted it to, to, to be unlocked earlier, we could drop. There's, there's a function that you can call drop to, to, to unlock this, or we could put a scope around it. Um, uh, the, the data that is protected by the lock is not uh, accessible uh, to code uh, before you lock it. Um, so, so there's no chance that you could access some, some field that is protected by a lock without actually acquiring the lock first. Um, here's um, uh, something that I point out which is really not related to, to, to locking, but it, it is uh, something relevant to this example, which is here we have a mem copy and we have a size of CMD, which has the potential of, of having the wrong size here. Um, we don't do that in Rust. Uh, this is a generic function and it, in, 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 it determines the size based on the type of the argument. Um, and then uh, one last thing in this slide is that uh, we call this self uh, SQDB submission queue doorbell. Uh, but this function actually expects the, the, um, the queue to be locked, right? So in, in C, there is no way to, to convey this, right? Which means that somebody could actually call this function uh, and not have the, the, the lock acquired. Uh, and that would be a problem in Rust. Uh, we prevent that. We say we need uh, the lock to be held. Um, um, I think this is the last one, um, which is how you do memory mapped I.O. Uh, again, everything's typed. We don't mix return values and, and error codes. Um, resources uh, become unavailable when the device is removed. I can talk about this uh, more later uh, if, if we have time. But this is the, the essence of, of, the, of the MMIO. Um, here we don't have uh, arithmetic uh, from um, uh, the device driver doesn't have to write arithmetic. It's actually if if we know what the what the offset is, which we do in this case, uh, then there's the all the checks happen at compile time. Um, and if we don't know what the offset is uh, from base uh, at compile time, you only know it at runtime. Then there are try variants that may fail if you specify an offset that is 
uh, beyond the end of the buffer, then uh, your read or write would um, would, would just fail. Um, so here I have uh, we have ten minutes to go, so um, I'll just go quickly uh, over this one. We just have a list of things that uh, of reasons why one might want to consider uh, doing Rust. Uh, the primary reason we are considering it and looking into it is, is for security, but it also gives us um, increased uh, uh, velocity in development because there's a whole set of, of errors that uh, just can't happen in, in Rust uh, by construction. Um, and um, this is uh, really all I wanted to show. These are just examples. Uh, there are many more. Uh, and another thing that I'd like to say is that this, these examples come from the state uh, where things are today. Um, if we find better abstractions, better way of doing things, we are, of course, um, uh, open to, 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 to doing them. Um, so what I'd like to, to hear from, from the community is um, whether you have um, questions on, um, on, on any of these things that I showed, if you have any concerns about the adoption of, of Rust uh, in the if you have any concerns about adoption of Rust in, in the upstream kernel, if you uh, have thought of uh, unforeseen difficulties, things that we haven't thought about, uh, general feedback. Uh, another thing is uh, pain points that uh, you may have in writing um, C drivers. Uh, I'm very interested in hearing about those because we can see if we can improve the experience in, 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 in Rust. Uh, also, uh, we could discuss possible paths, paths to upstreaming this effort. Um, yeah, so I'll stop here and I think somebody had. I uh, know this is Trilog. I was just kind of unmuting. Just, uh, so this is from Trilog from Qualcomm. And we did submit some of the SOC info drivers, uh, which is kind of non hardware based. But the next, which we'll plan to submit, is somewhat IRQ based, but most works on the ARM systems. And it's more of our Qualcomm SOC hardware blocks like uh, IPCC and uh, last level cache controller. Um, APIs basically, so both are unique in a way. Um, we do not, of course, hope to <laughs> get replaced our C drivers right now, but that will give you some sort of guidance on how it works on the real uh, Qualcomm SOC basically. Of course, it's already working, whatever you have with one driver we submitted recently. And uh, of course, there are some improvements to be done. Uh, but yeah, in, maybe in coming weeks, uh, the next plan is to see play with the bootloader. Uh, but again, that's maybe out of scope from here. Yeah. Uh, uh, thanks. Thanks. Thanks for submitting uh, that. Uh, one one thing that that I thought when when I when I saw that, and, and Miguel sort of touched on it. Uh, I, I thought it was great that that you guys uh, did the work to port it. Um, one thing that we're trying to do is is to actually build abstractions. So instead of calling the, the, the C functions directly from drivers, which requires unsafe code, what we're trying to do is we're trying to uh, wrap all these uh, C calls into um, um, Rust abstractions uh, and then expose those as safe abstractions to, to, to drivers. So part of our goal is to reduce uh, as, as close to zero as possible, uh, although we can't reduce everything uh, to zero, the, the number of, of unsafe calls uh, from, from, from drivers. Yeah, so it's more of, a, we are looking for more of how do we integrate the tool chains. The current problem we face is not really kernel specific, it's about how do we integrate the tool chains into our existing manifest, which is pretty much looks like a Android kernel manifest, um, uh, what you guys have on the kernel side, but it's more of how do we integrate it outside of the Android build systems? Basically, we do not really want to have it. So, and that way we can um, more of make it work for some of the systems programming projects, which is outside of Android. So anyway, that's another set of things to look at, but that's more of outside of upstream Linux kernel Rust program, but yeah. Cool, thanks, thanks for a lot. Good, good to know there's more happening in Qualcomm. There's some activity here in the chat. I don't know if if they're talking about this or something else. I think it's they're talking about the previous. I was kind of curious, just as far as um, the process of kind of migrating. You know how how you've had it. You know, learning Rust. Um, some of the stuff like the uh, scoped locks, I find 
really unintuitive just because I've, I've been, you know, my brain's in this pattern matching and finding a lock and unlock and matching that, you know, in every driver. And so having these kind of uh, subtle aspects that you see in like C++ kind of creep in uh, uh, can be somewhat concerning. So I don't know how, how much that's difficult to kind of adjust to, or is that something that you, you, you feel wasn't too hard? Yeah, so uh, um, I, I've 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 had similar feelings uh, as you, John. I, I'm a C programmer, uh, and and one of the things I disliked about C was that uh, it um, did things under the covers, right? That's that's how I felt when I uh, used some of these patterns. Um, but uh, th there's actually one um, aspect in which uh, uh, Rust does things differently from 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 C++ in, in res with respect to to logs. It's that uh, when and, and I didn't show it in these slides, I show it in a, in a different set, but uh, we actually have to separate what are the fields that are protected by, by some lock, right, into a different struct, uh, and that becomes a field in your struct with, with the, the wrapped in the lock, right? Um, so, so, so the idea here is that there is no syntactic way, like you can't write a program that actually, uh, five minutes, uh, thanks. Uh, there's no way for us to actually write some some code that access those fields uh, just using the safe fragment of the language, um, um, without having to go through 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 uh, this this uh, lock. Uh, now, uh, having said that, uh, you can actually, if you want, have the lock and unlock. It, 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 you can actually define those. You can you can go in your uh, lock definition and it's the guard actually. And specify an unlock function, for example, that consumes the the um, the guard, which means that the data is unlocked, so it's not available anymore after that point. Um, so, if if people actually uh, find that uh, uh, really unintuitive, then they like to see uh, unlocks, or they like to write the unlocks. It's certainly something uh, we can do. Uh, we can we can expose these sorts of of, of things. Um, and in fact, something perhaps that we should discuss, if it's something that uh, most people want to see, we can, we can do something like that. Uh, but uh, uh, actually answering your, your question of getting used to it, I, I thought it was okay getting used to it. Uh, um, I had a more fundamental question uh, regarding the, the, the sort of motivation for this. Um, so I, it seems to be like security based. Um, and, and so, and maybe I'm wrong, but my hunch has always been that security is not a very good driver for stuff inside the Linux kernel for driving topics. Or, um, and I was wondering if you could speak a bit about that. And, and, and is there any other motivation other than just security? I mean, is there, what's the other benefit? Uh, is there another sort of good compelling story to this than just security? Yeah, yeah, thanks, thanks, Karim. So uh, the thing is, um, um, Rust has actually a fundamental difference uh, from, from, from other widely used languages um, for, for doing uh, low-level systems, right? And, and that difference is the uh, memory safety uh, without the garbage collection, right? Um, so this actually allows us to, to, to eliminate uh, by construction uh, a whole set of, 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 of bugs that, that one would write. Um, and this is compelling for security because uh, this set of bugs are usually, uh, and there are some statistics that Miguel had posted, like 70 to 80% of all the vulnerabilities come from these memory safety issues, right? Uh, but this is, so this is actually a fundamental uh, difference between uh, Rust and C and C++ or, or any other uh, language that, that have been, uh, languages that have been used to write kernels. Um, but uh, as I tried to show in, in, in the previous slide, um, these uh, features of absence of, of, of actually memory safety and absence of undefined behavior doesn't help only for security. It actually helps with correctness as well. So it improves, thanks just one minute left. It also improves uh, the velocity, as I was saying. Uh, people sit down and went to, to write code. Um, uh, a whole bunch of things actually disappear. Data races is an example. Uh, you don't, we don't have data races in Rust. If you try to introduce a data race, uh, Rust catches it at compile time and prevents you from doing it. So would you say uh, that uh, writing drivers in Rust is, is more user-friendly and more approachable than writing them in C? Yes, yes. I, I would okay. say that's, that's, that's the case. Uh, because there's less things that you have to concern yourself with. So you can focus on, on driving your device rather than, oh, can this API here um, cause, cause me trouble? Uh, uh, in, in terms of inserting vulnerabilities in the system and things like those. So, well, for, for what it's worth, I would say that for me, that I think that would be more better selling point, this marketing side. <laughs> yeah. um, thanks, thanks we, for the
Okay. Yeah, we, uh, there was somebody else. We can go for the question. There was nobody behind you, so we're going to go for break afterwards. So go ahead. Go ahead, Miguel. I just wanted to comment, especially for maintainers. For a, as, a, as a maintainer, if you are reviewing a change to the driver, it's much easier to take a patch. In Rust, yeah. I would say, because you don't have to worry about it. Yes. Yeah, so, 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 yes. So, this is a good point that Miguel makes. Uh, in, in Rust, so we have this, this uh, safe uh, subset, a fragment of the language. Uh, that is what we want most people to do. Uh, but then, in certain cases, uh, you, we may have, we may actually break uh, uh, um, uh, the guarantees. So, in those cases, we specifically have to annotate this code as unsafe, right? Uh, so, there's like an unsafe curly brace and then some code in it, uh, which means that every time you're going to review some code, when you see that unsafe, you know that you have to pay attention to that piece of code and, and review it carefully. And the rest, you know that uh, it wouldn't introduce vulnerabilities, uh, memory related vulnerabilities. Yeah. All right, excellent. Thank you. So we are going for break. Um, and uh, when we come back, it will be uh, 10, 10 uh, Pacific. Um, I can't remember what it will be, UTC. Um, but uh, we will start with the speculative page faults, right? So thank you all. There we go. 5, 10 p.m. UTC. All right. Um, uh, thank you, Watson. And uh, we'll see you back, guys back in 15 minutes. Thanks. See you in a bit.
Hi, Michelle. Hey. Hey, I'm uh, just switching you yeah. over. Okay. Righty. So you should have presenter access now and you should be able to switch your slides. Yeah, that makes sense. Thank you. I'm just gonna yep, the hard works. All right, Michelle, uh, I think it's about 10.10. 10. I don't know if Karim's back, so if uh, you'd like to, the floor is yours. Yep, uh, thank you very much. So, well, first, you know, thanks to everyone who's here. Uh, my name is Michelle Espinas, and I'm going to start with a quick uh, disclaimer. Uh, this is work I did while I was employed at Google. I'm now a Facebook employee, and this stuff does not uh, intend to represent either company. So, um, this work um, was based on uh, ideas that were worked on previously by Laurent Dufour, Peter Zistra, probably others before that. And uh, Laurent Dufour presented a patch set about two and a half years ago. Um, it was deemed too complex for inclusion upstream at the time, that was at the LSFMM 2019. And, um, but many Android vendor picked it up because it was shown to improve application startup performance, and that's an important metric for these systems. So I came into this um, trying to come up with like a minimal version of these ideas, uh, something that would be uh, easier to get accepted, uh, ideally, you know, have less complexity, be more bisectable, uh, that sort of thing. Um, all right, and uh, well, so I, I have a patch that uh, that uh, the, the version I sent is based on uh, 5.12. Uh, I actually have more recent code that did to do more testing on uh, and, and send again. Um, so I'm gonna first explain a little bit of how it works. So in a page fold in the regular, you know, code without, uh, without dispatch it. Uh, the page faults uh, are executed under nmap read lock, and they might need to do things like, you know, typically they will allocate a data page, and that, that might be slow if you have memory pressure. 
And um, while that happens, you can have other threads um, modifying the VMA tree, for example, creating new mappings uh, during application startup, even if they really want to work on a different part of the address space. And, um, and that is kind of um, where we see these delays in uh, application startup performance. So what the budget is uh, doing is that it tries to uh, execute the, the page roll pass without taking a map lock in the current case. And um, so the writers will be able to execute. And um, in the page roll pass, well, we do have to be a bit more careful because there might be writers, you know, doing stuff that, that will interfere with us. So uh, we need to be careful. But um, in the end, uh, we will do some sort of transaction that will either succeed and atomically commit the results uh, at the end, or it will fail. And um, maybe because there was an interfering viper, uh, writer, or maybe because that's a more complex case, complex case that we don't have um, speculative path for. And in that case, it should abort, and we will just retry in the non-speculative way. I have a few more details on that. So in a normal page roll, we take the map read lock and we find the VMA, we check the permissions, then we go in handle MM4 so that does things like working the page table, finding what's the original page table entry. And then we do handle a PTE fault and that will resolve the fault in a number of different ways based on what's in the VMA, what's in the original page table entry, and the type of access we're doing. And only when all that is done, uh, it will uh, release the map block. So for example, in the anonymous page case, that would be if there was no uh, PTE originally, and that's an anonymous VMA, then it just allocates a page logs the page tables, inserts that page into, well, after looking the page table, it has to check the PT hasn't changed because there might have been another uh, page fault running concurrently that already resolved the, the fault for that address. But if the PT hasn't changed, then it will set the PT to the new data page and unlock the page table and that's how the fault is resolved. All right, so um, now we want to do all of these things, but uh, without having the map lock. So there's a number of things we have to be careful. And well, the first thing we need is to have a way to know if we interfered with any writer. And for that, I just have a sequence counter that every writer will increment at the start and at the end of the write. And so this is done just by instrumenting the mmap write lock and write unlock function so that it's very easy to know that we accounted for all log sites that way. And um, then we have to be careful about writers that might free the VMA. So for to protect against that, we make the VMA freeing uh, RCU safe. We need to be able to look up VMAs without having the lock. So it turns out that we can do that um, by just doing find VMA under the RCU read lock. So we, because we have the RCU read lock, we know we won't find any freed VMA, so we, we won't crash. Now, if someone changing the VMAs at the same time as we do that, we might end up getting the wrong VMA at the end, but we can check the counter and, and check for that. So if the counter hasn't changed, we know we had a successful lookup. If the counter changed, we may have any random VMA and we, we just gonna retry non-speculatively. And we also need to be careful 
about whenever accessing page tables. Uh, so, um, the, someone might be running on map while we're doing our page roll, so we have to make sure the page table stay there. And we there's already code in fast group that does that. We the, the short version we have to either use uh, ask you to protect the page table uh, that happens in power case then like there's a config options that that makes that happen or by disabling local interrupts and then that prevents uh, TLB should down so that prevents the page table from being freed indirectly but that's yeah and then at the end of the transaction I did um, point out there's this little place where we take the page table log to insert the PT that is the point where we can uh, do synchronization we have enough atomicity, atomicity at that point if we just uh, check the sequence counter after obtaining the page table log and the sequence counter has not changed at that time we can just insert our PT and uh, terminate the, the page for the transaction so that's the the short version of how how this all works um, now there's been so I, I posted that that was um in april there's been some um test results that have been posted by mediatek and qualcomm that show some positive test results um mediatek had some application that 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 goes up to 31 percent faster for startup uh, Qualcomm had a number of applications they tested that went from 10 to 18 percent faster. It does seem to to have the benefits that were um, already present in uh, Laurent's previous version that a lot of vendors have accepted. And so I would like, you know, I, I would like to to push harder for that to be accepted. I, I do believe this patch set is generally ready for upstream at least for the anon vma part of the patch set. i have some extensions to that 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 look into uh file pages and that's a bit more fancy a bit less uh less done so i would not be pushing for that right now but i, I think the anon um i think the anon path has a good case and um I would like to get more comments about pursuing it. Um, I was told to leave some time for questions. So I think uh, I'm done with my presentation. I, I would like to know what comments anyone has and I'm gonna open it for you. Uh, question is, uh, is there some kind of uh, workload where doing speculative page fault actually might cause uh, regression? Uh, yes, if you look for it, that's going to happen. So uh, generally, if you do things that are page fault intensive, we tend to see improvements. Now, you might see regressions in things that we don't have a speculative path for. And right now, since I, in the patch that I'm sending, I only implement the Anon case. So if you, if you hit files, uh, it might have to retry every time. Um, usually you find that very fast because you do your uh, VMA lookup at the start of the fault, you see that it's not a, a case you will handle and you can, um, uh, and it will abort right away. So the, the, the regressions are, are limited, but uh, yeah, if you look, so yeah, if you look in us, you, you can find some regressions. Yes. Uh, Michael, I thought the uh, the reason that uh, Laurel's patch wasn't accepted was that there was a regression when it was a single thread threaded application. Um, 
I have not seen that in my version. There, there can be small, very small difference, like in single digit. I, I, I have not seen large regressions in single thread with, with my version. So um, when actually, when I detect single threaded case, uh, I actually disable some of these things because we they, they don't actually help in the single threaded case. So uh, in that case, we actually don't speculate and we go directly to the uh, non-speculative path. Okay, and, and you said uh, if the VMA changes, it restarts. Is that on the VMA changing or the sequence number changing? Yes, yeah, so the, the detection is uh, not precise. It's just based on the sequence number. I can expand a little bit on that. So um, if while the page is uh, is going on, some other uh, writer changes uh, another completely unrelated part of the memory that will inc that will increment the sequence counter on the page road at the end will abort even though maybe there was no actual conflict if they worked on separate parts of the memory um, if you think of the android use case it turns out usually not to be a problem because um if the page roll took a long time, usually that's because it had to uh, allocate memory and it hit a reclaim path. And usually if that's the case, like you will need to allocate memory either way. So like it, it ends up, um, you end up having to retry, but the work you did uh, was not really wasted. Um, Now, it would be nice if we could have a precise test that would uh, let the fault proceed um, if it's a false conflict. That's not always trivial to do. I, I did have a slide, uh, kind of a backup slide that goes a little bit on that. So that's if you do, if you break, copy and write, Man, I'm gonna have to talk about it at least like three minutes to really answer your question. So yeah. um, if you break copy and write, there's this uh, thing where uh, you take a reference on the original data page, then you unlock the page table, you make a copy of the original data page, and then you lock again and you try to replace the original with your copy. Um, and in the non-speculative way, the whole thing is protected by a map lock, so there cannot be any writer making changes to that page while you make the copy. Now, if you do it speculatively, it could be that while you make the copy, someone changes the permissions, makes the page writable, writes into it, makes it read-only again, and at the end, when you are ready to commit your copy, the PT is still the same, but the data has changed while you were, were making your copy and you, you could have some corruption that way. So there are cases, so it's not trivial to, to always handle the, to always reliably detect if you had a true conflict or not. And because of that, I, I, I just went for the simplest way of just using the, the counter because that worked well enough for the Android use case. Um, right, and, and, and your Android use case, that's that's startup time that was increased, right? It wasn't uh, runtime uh, multi-threaded applications? That was mostly start time that was uh, measured. Okay, I was, I was just wondering if you have something like, uh, I think the eBusy test uh, creates a bunch of threads and uh, reads through the VMAs and edits uh, modifies one, uh, this wouldn't help, would it? it or would it? I, did, I do not remember. I, I do think I run EBZ. I don't remember what resource I got. I think that was, I think Qualcomm had a 10% EBZ uh, 64 improvement uh, that they posted, but I, Okay, thanks. 
and Michelle. Um, Michelle. Yes. Uh, so I, I just, sorry. Um, I just, uh, re regarding um, Liam's question about the, the single single thread use case, I just checked your, your, your results for a get checkout. And it seems just like it was a, just a 2% hit. So like nothing too concerning. Shaquille? Uh, yeah, Michelle. So there was a question from Shaquille on chat, which is, uh, what is the current potential blocker for merging this work upstream? Yeah. Um, so I did post the first version of the patch set. It had, it included also the file uh, cases that I think are really not as uh, baked. And so um, there was some pushback there, which I think may, made sense. I have posted a newer version that really just does anon. I really didn't get many comments on that. So uh, I think there's, I think there's a um, review bottleneck and I haven't pushed in us uh, was switching jobs. It was a bit complicated. Uh, I think that's a review bottleneck mainly. Oh, at, yeah. It's fine. You can continue, but uh, it's just we're, we're going to switch uh, pretty quickly. Go ahead. Yeah, I just took of it as a review bottleneck. I don't think there's any major obstacle that I can see other than that. I was hoping that people who objected to SPF two and a half years years ago, so that's mostly Susie Falls could, you know, have a look at this patch and see if their objections at the time for complexity have been resolved, but they, they really have not had time to look at it and I haven't pushed more. Okay, uh, thank you, Michelle. Um, so we can continue the conversation on Friday um, at the buff. Uh, we will be switching to um, John for the improving AOSP dev board collaboration. Thank you. All righty. Hey, so I'm John Stoltz and I work for Lenao and uh, this is my talk on improving AOSP dev board collaboration. Thanks everybody for uh, making it through a <laughs> long session. So uh, hopefully this one won't be quite as technical. Um, so when folks talk about AOSP dev boards, usually they're talking about kind of the smallish set of devices that are in the AOSP source tree that are supported uh, in AOSP directly. Um, you know, I have them listed here. It's a, a, not, not a huge number. Um, and it's maintained by a smaller set of, of different teams. Um, but outside of AOSP, um, there's still a lot of devices and dev boards um, that folks are taking a number of different efforts to try to uh, get AOSP to run against. Um, we've got uh, Global Logic's Glowdroid uh, effort uh, supporting the Orange Pi, PinePhone, and the Raspberry Pi devices. Um, there's the various uh, upstream form factor efforts like the Poco F1, OnePlus 6. Um, 96 boards has like a community AOSP build for uh, the Dragonboard 410C as well as the 820C. Um, there's the Android RPI project, the So Mainline project, and I'm sure others. I apologize if I, I don't have your project listed here. Um, now, being an AOSP, it's it's great, uh, but there are a few minor issues that we've we've uh, run into over time. Um, one aspect is that you know all of the submissions we have to get a, a Google developers review and uh, help with merging. Um, and this, you know, it's one of those things I don't necessarily mind, but uh, uh, it requires a lot of back and forth with Google developers, which they might find a little <laughs> labor, laborious. Um, you know, they basically have to review it, approve it for pre-submit testing. Unfortunately, uh, Treehugger, the pre-submit uh, test tool, uh, regularly sees failures. Sometimes it's just the entire tree, something else is wrong in the tree. Um, and the problem there is that there's no external visibility to the debug log. So we then have to go and bother the Google developers again to say, hey, you know, did I do that? Is, is that something, you know, that uh, uh, is just the trees down? Um, and then even if the pre-submit finally does uh, uh, pass, there's only like a two-day window um, for it to be valid. And so we have to kind of get the Google developers' attention again and ask them to push the button to merge it. Um, and so it's just one of those things where I don't think any of the Google developers would, would complain about it, but it, it does 
make it clear that it's a burden a bit, you know, they have other work to do and, and, and we're kind of constantly nagging and pestering them. Um, additionally, some of the, I guess, maybe theoretical benefits that we were kind of hoping for uh, being an AOSP didn't quite play out. Um, so one aspect is that, you know, uh, when changes or requirements are, are made inside of AOSP, it's not something that uh, those requirements, they don't go through and necessarily force every device to move to them. There's kind of every, device is owned by its own kind of maintainer and that's left to, to them to do that. Um, additionally, the dev boards are not necessarily used uh, deeply for pre-submit testing. Um, so when we see regressions, it's usually after those changes have landed. Um, now the Google developers are really helpful in trying to you know, help resolve any regressions that, that their codes might have changed or their changes might have uh, caused. Um, but again, if it's something that is just a, you know, something off in the, the device uh, directory, or um, you know something else, it just can sometimes feel like you're on your own. Additionally, AOSP, you know, it is really <laughs> hundreds of Git trees kind of uh, taped together with repo tape, um, and so it's one of those things where there's no way to really even clearly bisect a problem. So when you have a regression, it could have been in any one of these number of Git trees. Um, and they often have cross dependencies. So it's not something that's easily to narrow down what's exactly wrong to try to flag the developer to help uh, uh, figure out the solution. Um, and additionally, just keeping up with OSP is difficult. Um, I recently gave a talk at uh, Lenar Connect on this, you can see at the link. Um, but uh, Dimitri Schmidt, who uh, worked on the original uh, Heike uh, effort uh, in Google, um, he kept some stats and found that there was about two and a half AOSP regressions that were hitting each week. Um, and this is, you know, great, you know, the boards are doing their job and they're finding lots of bugs and getting those fixed. Um, but the hard part was if anyone takes a vacation, like when you come back, the board's not going to be working. Um, and so just the space at which AOSP moves is, you know, immense. And so bit rot is a real issue. Um, now, the way that Lenaro kind of handles this is that we kind of leverage our experience across our devices. So if we see a problem on the Heike 960, it's likely we're going to see the problem on the Dragon boards. Um, and so, uh, you know, it's one of those things where we try to share knowledge between uh, folks in the team to be able to kind of quickly solve these. Um, we also share this knowledge uh, with folks who are working on the uh, upstream form factor efforts, um, as well as also with uh, other teams like uh, the ICAO effort that the Android TV and Bay Libre uh, developers uh, maintain. Um, for example, we borrowed the Yukawa audio howl for the Dragon Board 845 because it was better than what we had initially. Um, and we've helped them a little bit with some of the GKI uh, efforts as well. Um, and we're also working closely with some of the Android TV folks on trying to get the uh, V4L2 uh, Codec 2 support going. Um, so it's one of those things where I think this cross-pollination and sharing is really important and, and kind of critical at times. Um, let's see here. So my big Lenaro <laughs> uh, idea is maybe we should all work together, you know. Um, whether we're, you know, in AOSP or out of AOSP, I think it would be good to have a bit of a, a community um, where we can kind of share our experiences and our debugging um, and, and maybe even find ways to share effort and create better generic solutions. Um, so the initial grand idea is something like an external AOSP tracking community. So this would kind of leverage a lot of the ideas of lineage OS, um, but it would be AOSP focused instead of focusing on Android releases. Um, you know, this would allow us to be able to add boards uh, at different quality levels um, without necessarily having a lot of tight interlock with Google. Um, we would, of course, need some rules for, you know, acceptance for what is required to be included, as well as, you know, if, if a board's not uh, building for two weeks, it's probably time to remove it. Um, so we need those sorts of standards. <clears throat> Additionally, I think uh, one of the ideas from Glodroid is really interesting is that Glodroid is really ahead of AOSP in a lot of ways because it uses upstream branches for a number of the external uh, AOSP projects, things like Mesa and MoveDRM. Um, and I think this is really useful because it kind of, in effect, is the Linux next of AOSP. Um, and I think it would be cool to have that sort of integration where we're able to kind of have a proving ground for both the upstream projects as well as new dev boards and being able to test all of that out uh, before any changes necessarily get to AOSP. Um, some of the benefits here, I think, you know, this would greatly reduce the burden on the Google developers. Um, it would also provide a, a wider set of hardware for folks who are doing any sort of prototyping against AOSP uh, to select against. They could, wouldn't have just the small set that's in AOSP. Um, and then also, again, hopefully would have more shared cross-device effort, things like uh, generic HALs.
So I did float this around inside of Lenaro and with our members. Um, and a lot of folks thought this was, you know, sounds like a good idea, um, but it isn't something that folks are likely to fund. <laughs> um, and so it's one of those things where, you know, we would need some hosting and infrastructure if we're going to do any sort of enforcement of uh, building rules or, or booting testing. Um, we're gonna need CI loops and, and labs and, and staff. And so that's going to cost uh, something. Um, additionally, I think while all of our, the different projects out there are, um, you know, kind of doing similar work in their own corners. It's not clear that everybody really has the same vision necessarily. So we would need some sort of governance. I, the last thing I want to have is everybody kind of into one project and then just start arguing with each other. Um, and, and additionally for Google, at least, uh, the NAOSP dev boards aren't really going away. It's one of those things they see it as useful, um, not only for testing against AOSP, but they also use it for testing uh, internal branches, which wouldn't be possible with uh, any external project. So scaling back a bit, um, figured, you know, maybe we can have some sort of lighter weight collaboration. Um, you know, maybe it's something just as simple as a wiki that so we can just find each other and, and, and have a place where people can kind of list their projects and what devices they're working on. Um, having something like an IRC channel or a mailing list, I think would be really useful uh, uh, to kind of do some collaborative uh, uh, discussion and, and, and troubleshooting. Um, uh, it was proposed maybe a shared bug list would be useful. Um, and that might be something we could look at. Uh, it might even be able to just add a tag to Google's issue tracker and that might be a way to do that. Um, so yeah, so that is the extent of my proposals at this point. I wanted to open up for discussion uh, and thank everybody for listening. So I guess the floor is open for uh, ideas or questions there. I just have one question, John. What would be your preference to what can be changed i'm sorry could you say that again uh, what would be your preference in the ideas that you mentioned about what can be changed is it one or all of them like for example the shared issue tracker is one uh, the collaboration like for example from my experience we can well like for, we always mention the emails and whatnot and i'll tell you what the, there's not much email traffic we get there are mm -hmm. exactly three people whom we hear from, uh, or one of them is you. Uh, so, <laughs> so I'm. We are all up to, up and open to do everything that you suggested. I think that's a great idea. The only worry that I have is whether or not, or how much do we need it? Because we've never been able to figure out figure out how much it is needed by people. Because we'd never hear from people around it, at least from Android or Google side. Uh, we've had our emails, like for example, if I look at my kernel team at android.com email, there are probably like no more than 10 emails in a year and not even a month. So yeah, we can have an IRC, we can have issue tracker. It's very easy for us to do. The only thing is we just never had the need to do that yet. If yeah. there is such a push and there is such a need, I think we'd like to hear from everybody and then we're happy to do it. Yeah, and I think, I mean, to some extent, I think the hope here is that, you know, well, having the, the email for the, the, the Android kernel team is great. Um, that's not something that's a publicly available thing. So it's one of those things where it's good for engaging with Google. Um, but I think the aspect that I'm trying to figure out is how can we get more of the various disparate groups who are doing AOSP-based development outside of AOSP, um, how to get kind of everybody collaborating in a way that they can kind of interact together. Because I feel like there's just so many cases where you just find on GitHub some tree where somebody already has solved a similar problem. I know the uh, looking at the GlowDroid project is, is, is really interesting because they've got a lot of great solutions in there that we you know uh, had to look at. So it, it's, it's um, just something I feel like there, there's an opportunity for more uh, shared effort there. What about the individual vendors themselves? I mean, the, the silicon vendors do have their own teams doing this stuff. Um, and honestly, uh, for you know, working with a lot of customers that use those trees, uh, they're often sort of ancient and and not so well sort of, you know, maintained. Um, um, and I don't want to name anybody here, but you know, is is there any sort of outreach effort that could be made um, to possibly, you know, uh, coalesce all this effort into? Uh, into something more coherent um, in addition to the community folks that we're talking about here? I think one of the issues there might be just the focus. And so I think a lot of the vendors are likely focused on the next Android release rather than on AOSP. 
Um, and again, keeping up with AOSP is very difficult. So I can understand them not wanting to like, you know, kind of have two efforts uh, going all the time on that. Um, I don't, I can't really speak for particular right, vendors right. To, on that. Some of them have dev boards that are out there, you know, mm -hmm. uh, and, and uh, are not necessarily, you know, uh, next, but rather sort of, you know, back. <laughs> um, yeah, uh, and, I think and, that just and, mostly speaks to how hard it is to keep up because it's much easier to true. target a fixed Android release, make a, you know, release and, and, and sell a board and then just kind of be done. Um, you know, trying to keep up is, is, is hard. Yeah, because this is one of the things that we get as a request is like, okay, we are choosing, you know, silicon vendors as chip X, Y, and Z. They have a dev board, but, you know, it's that version. We'd like a newer version. Can you do that? I mean, that sort of stuff is, is, is standard that we see. And, and uh, I can't imagine that there's no way to sort of uh, maybe entice those, those players. And then we can you know, discuss some names offline if you want uh, to, to possibly join in some efforts like that. Let's see, uh, Laurent's brought up the Mason based uh, build system as well. And that's, that's kind of also been a big pain point and kind of one of those points that I said that, you know, it's kind of hard to necessarily figure out how to align everyone's different vision on this, because I know the uh, Android build project is, is opinionated on, on, on what they want to be able to use for their uh, build system. And uh, integrating with Mason is not something that I, we, we have a great solution for right now. I know uh, there's been some neat work in the Mesa project uh, by Roman uh, Serenko of uh, the Glowdroid effort um, to try to enable that, but that's still something that it, it lets uh, uh, Mesa be built with Mason, but kind of not within the proper hermetic uh, uh, AOSP build, at least to my understanding. I need to spend some more time with it. Uh, for the things that you list here, at least a wiki, IR channel, or mailing list, is there anything preventing us, you, from just doing it? Would you think it should be like a Linaro thing, Android.com thing? I have no idea. So. It's one of those things where I, 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 this is what I'm kind of just bringing up to the group here because, uh, you know, I want to make sure that we're including folks who are already out in the community. Um, so, you know, I, I feel like Lenaro and Google have, have a lot of interactions and, you know, want to make sure we kind of have other voices in there. Yeah. Right. One of the things that uh, sort of keeps coming back <clears throat> as uh, a need for documentation is sort of like some of the flags that are used in the board descriptions, like build underscore foobar. Um, and then people ask, you know, where does this document it? And my only sort of good answer is, well, grab the sources for one of the Pixel devices, um, which is not sort of super satisfying um, because it's sort of like it's like magic. Uh, and any documentation I think about that would be would be very 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 useful. Yeah, I very much agree. That was a, a couple points in that talk I linked to um, cover a lot of the things that I kind of see as potential improvements to documentation we might be able to do in the future. Yeah, I think we've taken that feedback last time as well. So for what it's worth, all of our documentation is now kept up to date live, well, at least from system software perspective on uh, source.android.com. The thing is, there are two problems with it is that we can't necessarily say it for all of Android, uh, but generally your board bring up ends up dealing with what we do a lot because once you get past that hurdle the framework more or less just works and you don't have any problems but there is one of the other feedback that we took last year which we did a slightly better on but still haven't done as well as i would like us to do which is to actually have that documentation link and relate to each other to make it easy like what Curry mentioned easy to find now, so if you go to source.android.com and like start with the architecture, you'll see everything you do, we do, including dev boards. But there, it's still riddled with some problems where some documentation may be obsolete and some may live in readmes in individual projects that get linked back and forth from source.android.com. So yes, we absolutely understand this is, but it'll take a while. We've been doing this and we've, uh, at least for the last year and a half, and our documentation is now live updated with the code, which also then brings up with new set of problems where now it's too up to date because then it keeps changing because we've heard that too. Uh, but we'll, we will, we are, there is a conscious effort, at least within Google and Android, 
for to keep the documentation up to date as we make AOSP changes. And we make it up, we keep it up to date in relation with AOSP and not with each Android release. That may also, that has also triggered a lot of alarms with people. Like for example, uh, Android 12 may be out in a few months, uh, but so all the documentation that you'll see, some will be, will reflect to what AOSP is right now, but people are still using Android 11. And they say, oh, I don't see that. And where is that? I don't see that in my Android 11 code. So there's there's always a mix. It's a mixed bag of problems that we have. So we don't know which way to go, whether we keep it and only update it at the time of release or whether we keep it up to date with AOSP because AOSP is being used by other people too. So, uh, but yeah, we're figuring it out. We're, and, and if we try to keep it separated per release, then writing documentation will probably take more time than writing the code that the documentation describes. <laughs> so uh, yes, we hear that loud and clear, but hopefully it's been better. We'd like to hear feedback on what's missing, at least the big ticket items. For example, the GKI part was one, which I think Karim flagged last time. There's no one place where, if I want to start developing on AOSP kernel, where do I start? Uh, so we made it part of the kernel readme itself and start from there. But I know that a lot of it also exists on source Android.com and it doesn't interlink properly. So we're working on that now. Yeah, I, I think for, for uh, I'm sorry, if for source.android.com, I think one thing that would help um, is if it's if it's checked in, which I assume there's some sort of a, I mean, we there is a sort of a repository behind it. If you could just tick and say, okay, I want version X of the documentation. Um, I think that would help people that are sort of looking for the information for version, you know, whatever that's sort of gone by. Um, there's some questions on the chat too. Yeah, I was going to say, Kevin's asked uh, basically with the house kind of always evolving inside of Google, but not necessarily publicly, how do we collaborate better on the new house if we don't work for Google or Lenaro? Oh, the HAL interfaces, 99% of them are actually contributed into to AOSP directly. So that's where you'll see, you'll probably, you probably see newer HAL interfaces already now in AOSP that are not part of uh, Android 11, for example. And Android 12 isn't officially uh, out yet. So you'll see new HAL interfaces. So it's already, it's always in USB. Just follow hardware interfaces. There's a two project, hardware interfaces and I think framework interfaces. That's where all the new HAL interfaces are. Those, so those the example I had in mind there was the Codec 2 HAL, which is in which is not functional in AOSP and it's not coming until uh, Android 12, which isn't public. And so the those ones, when we have boards that have the upstream kernel features that are ready for Codec 2, there's no way for us to work on those until Google decides to push that stuff. Right. So that this is an example. So I'm especially these upstream focused drivers where we're trying to actually have the upstream kernel ready for AOSP, but we can't actually see the HALs or work on the HALs. This is a potential for better collaboration is what I'm getting at. Absolutely. So one of the things that we do is for all hardware uh, interfaces, all the HAL interfaces that show up in AOSP, I think it's we make sure that if there is at least a single one if not a full implementation, at least a mock implementation of it uh, that runs in AOSP. And we, so basically, and that is Cuttlefish. If, it, if, it, if people who don't know what Cuttlefish is, that's a virtual Android product platform. That's how Android gets tested at scale in AOSP. So if there is a HAL that lands in AOSP and that doesn't have a Cuttlefish implementation, that's something that we would like to know because that's the whole idea of doing this to making sure there is a reference implementation landing with the interface. So people can then use that reference implementation to implement their own uh, house and then report problems if they have it. That's, so, but if, of course, there are some cases, some HAL implementation may not be possible in Cuttlefish, but we've been able to find solutions for pretty much every one of them. So me and Alistair is probably not there. We'd love to know if that is the case that you saw any hard, uh, an interface land in OSP that doesn't have an implementation at least. At, there, it, there should at least be a Cuttlefish implementation there. By yeah, the way, we're sort of um, just just in terms of um, the MC itself, we're sort of um, you know past uh, John's talk. So there's like a 20 minute slot which is open for discussion. So we can continue this for this one. If there's anything else that people want to bring back or anything in the questions, um, it's completely open at this point. Yeah, I just think it's only 10 minutes. But I did want before, to just one quick question before people drop off. For Bob, are we kind of planning slots for what to talk about when, or how do you plan to handle that? 
All right. So what is the plan for the BOF? Um, uh, we did not sort of, uh, honestly, since we were sort of uh, struggling at the, uh, until the last minute to get it actually scheduled, we didn't get the chance to talk this over. Um, uh, Todd, John, and uh, uh, the other folks and myself. Um, so um, I'll just throw this out there. It's not definitive, but my assumption would be sort of um, just, uh, you know, going through the topics that we had in the order that we had today. And, and sort of opening it up and, and sort of putting a, bit, a few bounds there just to make sure that uh, um, other topics get the chance to be discussed. Um, if somebody else has a better sort of proposal, um, it's all open. Um, one one okay. additional note, can we maybe take a list of things where we know for sure we have need to have discussions and then maybe a sense yeah. thoughts? So, uh, Sarna, I've already made that list uh, while taking notes. So. I'll share with the uh, MC uh, uh, organizing team and then we'll probably push out something hopefully by tomorrow. Thank you, Sumit. Yeah. yeah, perfect. Thank you, Sumit. Sure. So again, um, it's an open discussion um, slot. Uh, we have uh, 20 minutes, I mean, 17 minutes to go. Um, you're free to bring up any topic um, uh, that we have not discussed uh, uh, fully or, or anything else uh, that you would like to discuss. Um, afterwards, uh, it's sort of um, the recording ends and, and uh, sort of we go offline in terms of uh, uh, YouTube live streaming and um, the uh, pro professional production team that's behind that. Um, so at this point, I'll just, uh, you know, mute myself and turn my camera off, but you're welcome to sort of jump in and take the, take the, uh, the, the floor. Um, there was a question. Yeah, there was a question from uh, Caleb that I've already put in notes, which is uh, basically, are there any sensible standard ways currently to easily share uh, HAL between devices? Like audio HAL, tiny HAL is, uh, was, was discussed. Uh, do we want to discuss it here or is it okay to discuss it over chat? Yeah, that's one I'm kind of interested in as well. I know um, sometimes there's been some hesitancy, I guess, to add new pro new Git trees to AOSP. Um, but I think as we have, if we have a couple of devices that are using it, I think it's an easier thing to, you know, push for. Uh, we just have to be able to get Google to agree to it. So it's I, a little involved. I'm sorry, I, I didn't really understand what that question meant. Did so John if there, if, yeah, so if there's a generic HAL that was going to be shared across other devices. Right now, what we tend to see is uh, a number of devices basically fork their own copy and put that in their direct device directory. Um, but that ends up just with a lot like, you know, the audio HAL, for example, like where we you know, borrowed the Yukawa audio HAL. Um, it would probably be better to have a generic HAL um, where, you know, we have a project inside of AOSP, its own Git tree, that then different projects could include if they need it. I see. Hmm. But I know the process of adding a new project to the manifest yeah, is that, the new a, the a new project and it'll still need some sorry. It'll still need uh, somebody from Google site to do all of that and it needs a user there as well. So that's a whole a whole bunch of problems. But we can do that, but it is an involved process like you know. Yeah, and I guess I would suggest starting off with kernel team at android.com. If you drop us an email, we are very responsive and we can go from there. And then we can have a public issue tracker even. So I'd love to get people used to that as well, because then it becomes easier for us and for everybody else outside to monitor and track. Since there are no other questions, I'll, I'll throw a bunch of questions that I never got to uh, in my presentation. And uh, people can bring it back during the BOF or talk about it here. 
But a couple of questions I had was like, are there any DT bindings that uh, firmware DevLink is not currently processing that people want to see added, uh, except the networking related properties that I'm already aware of? That was one question. And actually, the firmware DevLink uh, help any of your use cases? I've never really heard back on hey, where is it helping. That'll be kind of nice to hear too. Um, yeah. Um, so maybe uh, we could sort of um, take a bit of this time here to plan for the BOF collectively since we're all already here. Um, Sumit, you had mentioned that you had taken some notes. Um, do you want to possibly sort of um, go through that uh, and, and sort of list it out to people so they can sort of add or, you know, possibly sort of uh, suggest other things? Sure. So we had uh, 10 sessions and I know that uh, for sure firmware DevLink needs a session. Um, there was more discussion uh, around DMA buff uh, allocation attribute, but probably that would happen at the GPU mem tracking uh, microconference, and we can get back uh, to it later. Um, the thermal core usage challenge couldn't finish, so we definitely require time for that. Um, I'm not sure about the DM snapshot in user space with whether it requires more buff time because I didn't see a lot of questions that uh, were there towards the end. Uh, likewise, on the FS stacking with fuse, I'm not very sure if there are questions around. I know that the UCLAMP C group ones had questions uh, pending towards the end, so we probably should plan for that. And then the last one, the GKI uh, one, I don't think should need one. So we have about five, I think, sessions that, um, and this excludes actually the last three sessions because I didn't uh, get to tag them accordingly. So I'm not sure about speculative page files. Do we need a session? Um, likely, likewise for the, yeah, the, uh, Drivers in Android drivers in Rust, I didn't see many questions that uh, would drive any discussion. So I don't know if that's, uh, let me just list the ones I feel need one uh, in the shared notes and we can see. For speculative page faults, if uh, I do plan to participate to the Android both after 9.15, so in case there are questions about it. Okay, sure. Thank you. Um, so, Karim, we could uh, uh, probably just use this document itself and uh, tag what you want to discuss. Let me just start with, okay, let us find the dev link. And uh, I'm okay with going in the order we talked about, too. So yeah, we could do that, or if there are only a few, then we could probably try to um, work around stuff, because I know that I also would like to attend the C group around the buff thing that's happening on Friday, uh, and I'm sure there will be a few others. Right, yeah, yeah, I mean, on the ones we do decide to talk, it's okay to go by order by me. Put another way, I'm, I prefer later time. Okay. I'd be up when it starts, but my brain will probably work later. <laughs> <laughs> okay. Uh, yeah. All right, so um, just so if for uh, in the interest of time here, just so we're sort of at the end of the um, the micro conference here, um, you know, people are, are sort of more than free to sort of stick around, but I'm not guaranteed that the recording will continue after, after uh, 11 Pacific. So I would like to um, thank everybody for participating. This has been great. Uh, we look forward to welcome you again on, on Friday. Uh, and we again thank our sponsors and the uh, organization committee um, on behalf of um, Todd, uh, John, uh, Rick, uh, Sumit, Amit, and myself. I'd like to thank you all. 
um, and look forward to continuing this conversation on Friday. So I will turn my webcam off here and uh, the audio off, but if you want to sort of continue talking or chatting, um, I'm all for it. Uh, again, I just not guarantee that any of that will continue being recorded.